This, so this, so this is from, so everyone, this is from an account called Millet Explains. Um, and it's called Why Top Economists Are Often Wrong. Now, in principle, I, uh, yeah, yeah, Argentinians, I, I'm sorry. I'm very salt, sorry. Um, for you, I mean, he, he seems, it's, you know, one, the Bol Bolsonaro is replaced and you end up with Javier Malay um, next door. It's like you can't, you know, Latin America has to have one, at least one, several, in fact, a quota of absolutely off their nut leaders. Um, but yeah, so, 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 <laughs> so let's, let's just see. This is, this is his general vibe, I feel. La, el análisis de mercado que tiene que ver con esto que explica tan brillantemente Hustle en su libro La economía en una elección, que dice cuál es la diferencia entre el buen economista y el mal economista. Bueno, el mal economista solamente mira un mercado y no tiene en cuenta los efectos sobre otros mercados ni tiene tampoco en cuenta los efectos hacia adelante. Es decir, la, lo, digamos, la diferencia entre hacer equilibrio parcial de un solo periodo y hacer equilibrio general intertemporal vendría a ser. Okay, so it's worth what he's just said, right? Is like, oh, no way. This is uh, this is peaking this mic now. Uh, so what what he's just said is that um, uh, <laughs> a good economist takes into account all markets, not just one, um, and that they look at things over time. And not not just looking at a single snapshot shot. How many economists, whether mainstream academic economists or economic journalists or economics graduates working in government or private sector economists, people in the tech sector, people in the financial sector, uh, or heterodox economists or Marxist economists? Uh, or or post Keynesian economists, uh, or Austrian economists, or institutionals, institutionalists. How many of them do you think don't do that? The answer is like close enough to zero, right? <laughs> of course, almost every economist tries to take into account things that happen over time and things that happen in different markets, depending on the question. If I'm just studying the automobile market, I might restrict my attention to that, uh, at least in the first step, right? And it could be that the impact on other markets is not big enough for me to bother about in that particular piece of research or article. It's pretty simple, right? What he's saying is he's saying something that he's trying to make sound really deep, uh, but it's not that deep. And one of the things about Henry Hazlitt and economics in one lesson, which is like a really big popular thing among among YouTubers, uh, among YouTubers, well, on YouTube, um, among among uh, libertarians on YouTube, uh, very big online. Economics in one lesson, by the way, not a text that you will ever reference uh, on on a, a university degree in economics. Like it's not. It's just not considered like an actual lesson in economics. It's considered a very biased free market lesson in economics. So when, when someone like Hazlitt or, or Millet says that he you should take into account t time periods uh, in the future and when you should take into account general effects, general equilibrium effects in across all markets, when they say that, what they're really saying is the government can't do anything because either over time or in other markets, it's going to have negative spillovers, right? Which affect which affect things negatively. So when they say the difference between a good and a bad economist, what they're saying is a bad economist calls for government intervention, but doesn't realize that government intervention necessarily results in inferior outcomes. Okay, so it's it's that's the reason they're saying it. It's a biased, it's already biased, right? It's not just that they're saying, look across all markets, and try to keep time in in your head, right? Try to notice that there are years ahead of the current one, because obviously everybody knows that. 
So what they're doing is biasing it towards like the law of unintended conse consequences, right? When the government do tries to do something good, like raise the minimum wage, oh no, it's going to have negative effects by increasing inflation or creating unemployment. So you need to look at those. But that that's that's why they're saying this, right? Let's say I robotize my factory to make more money. Yo, yo robotizo mi planta. Bueno, para algo lo hago, lo hago para ganar plata. De vuelta, ¿ahora qué hago con esa plata? ¿Qué hago con esa plata? La consumo, genero puestos de trabajo en otro lado. Digo, la, invi la, la invierto, creo yo, puestos de trabajo y, y me... Okay, so, <laughs> so this example isn't even like a free market example. It's just a really weird one. So I robotize my factory and make a lot more money. Um, but okay, what if you robotize your factory and then the entire industry robotizes their factories and then costs fall and competition drives the price down and you don't make money so that you can't invest or consume it? Uh, what if you do make money, but you just don't invest or consume it, right? Like when you spend, when you spend money, okay, so also this, this is a mess, right? He, he, I think he, the point gets away from him here, by the way. So this is a mess because... If I invest it, I'll create jobs myself, right? Okay, but he's just said that he's destroyed jobs um, by by automating. So, I mean, is he starting a new factory here? Puesto de trabajo y y mejoro la calidad. And and improve the quality and price of goods. So, I mean, it's just like assuming that the he makes money from robotizing the factory, which isn't necessarily given, and it's just assuming that he invests money, which he may well not do, right? y el precio de los bienes y le, le mejoro la vida a todos porque además tiene más plata para gastar en otras cosas digamos la ahorro y convierto eso se convierte okay so again if i save it banking that becomes an investment somewhere else that that's that's not true right like it, it's not necessarily the case if you okay so firstly you can save without putting into a bank right you can put money aside and there is this massive misconception that when you save money you necessarily that necessarily results in investment and i think that the the problem here is that the word saving and investment are used in the wrong um in in the wrong cases right people use them in multiple different cases and they assume they're interchangeable when actually in different cases they mean different things uh on aggregate savings in the macroeconomic income identities that actually just means investment right it actually just means like investing money in capital goods and putting them aside that's what saving is as a component of income at a macroeconomic level it actually has very little to do with putting money aside now if you put money into a into a bank you improve their position right you improve their capital position okay but that doesn't necessarily result in more lending. If banks want to lend money, then they can, and they'll be accommodated by by central banks, or or potentially by other market forces. Is it possible to move? Oh yeah, good. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, my uh, uh, my window's in the way. I'll put myself up here. Right. So. It's 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 worth saying, right? So what what started this is that he is a really weird example, um, but he's just automated away a load of jobs in a factory, right? And he isn't really talking about the workers that this happened to, which is which is just which is just like a massive oversight, right? He says he's talking about all markets, but he's he's not. Um. Yeah. So yeah, he doesn't mention the entire sector's worth of income that was just lost. Yeah, robotizing causes people to lose jobs. Yeah. It's, uh, anyway, so so this this just this just doesn't follow. And he, he's not engaging with when people complain about automation. He's not engaging with the main point they make, which is that people lose their jobs. Although maybe he does in a second. Mira que digamos, se puede llegar a ser tan perverso, ah, tan complicado como ser humano que la uno en la tierra. Hago desaparecer ese dinero. ¿Sabes qué? Digamos, se achica la cantidad de dinero, la economía, el nivel de precios es más bajo, digo, se beneficia entre toda la población y beneficia más a los que son más castigados. Okay, so again, again, hello, Floyd. Um, again, <laughs> this, this just isn't true, right? If, if, you, if you withdraw money 
from the economy, then what can happen is that there's a general demand deficiency and the economy fails to reach full employment. Okay, and this does not necessarily result in some kind of fall in prices. Uh, it's not clear that if it did result in a fall in prices, that would be a good thing. Deflation is often associated with economic downturns. If everyone's prices and incomes are falling, then there's no reason to invest. So there's not going to be the higher quality and lower price goods that he's talking about. That's that's just not going to happen. Uh, debt burdens, real debt burdens are, are going to increase, right? If your incomes and prices are falling, then your debts, which are nominal, right? They're just denoted in amounts. I have a mortgage of £300,000 that's going to increase, right, relative to your income. So it's not clear that even if this did happen, which it doesn't, by the way, and they tried it, they've tried it many times to deflate their way out of depression. Uh, they did it in the Great Depression, most notably, it didn't work. It's, it's not clear that even if it did, if even if it did actually happen, uh, that it would be a good thing. I don't think it is a good thing. I just think it just prolongs a, a downturn. For those affected by inflationary taxes, footnote, inflationary tax, prices going up non-stop. Does that, is he just, so prices going up non-stop is just inflation, right? That's, inflation is the rate of change. As long as it's positive, prices go up. But that doesn't, that's not a tax. In fact, based on what we just said, right, about how deflation can be bad, inflation can be good. Inflation is generally a sign of a growing economy at, at low levels, right? And depending on how inflation is distributed, that's the important thing. It can hit people differently, right? So calling inflation a tax, firstly, it's just, you know, making words meaningless because it's not. But also, it doesn't t necessarily affect people negatively. If prices go up by 5%, and my income goes up by 5%, that is inflation. That is prices going up nonstop. Um, and also, again, it c reduces debt burdens. If my mortgage is, uh, you know, uh, £3,000 uh, a month, then my income going up relative to that is going to reduce my debt burden, right? So that that's, that's really can be a good thing for people. Um, as long as the inflation isn't run away, and as long as wages and other incomes keep up with inflation. But he's not discussing that because that would force him to talk about something distributive, which might raise questions about politics and, and, and minimum wages and unions and so on and so on. Although, okay, Gustavo, I mean, I acknowledge, I acknowledge that, that you, you, you have a point there because Argentina does have a context of like runaway inflation. So, so that, is, that is true. Um, but, you know, the question of how to reduce that, I don't think this guy really has an answer to that that's going to be satisfactory. I think he would just basically want to collapse the economy, which would affect everybody uh, more negatively. Por el impuesto inflacionario los beneficiaría muchísimo más. Oh, is that it? Okay. Okay. Right. So, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I just thought it was like, uh, it was just like, basically... So to sum up the argument of, of that, by the way, in case, because it, it all went by quite quickly, what he seems to be saying is a really, really weird version, an extreme version of something that economists sometimes call Say's Law. Now, it has different interpretations, Say's Law, but I think the most common interpretation is um, this idea that supply creates its own demand. There can't generally be a demand shortage. As long as things are produced, people will buy them and we should reach full employment and if we don't reach full employment then prices and wages just need to fall in line with the scarcity of the real economy right um and so that seems to be what he has in mind but it is literally him saying when he talks about general equilibrium effects looking at all of the different markets he's basically saying what i do with my money makes absolutely no difference whatsoever to what happens. The economy is always going to work. So it doesn't matter if I automate away a load of jobs. And, what, and then assuming I make money from that, which I may not do, it doesn't matter if I, uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter if I save it in a bank. It doesn't matter if I invest it myself. It doesn't matter if I consume it and spend it. It doesn't matter if I put it under a mattress. The economy is always going to function. Now, this is obviously absurd, right? If 
everybody just destroyed all of their money, then there would be a massive problem. There would be a massive decline in employment. There would be a decline in the velocity of money, the rate at which money was circulating. This would be a huge, huge problem. And it's almost this this bizarre idea that the economy exists in a certain form and has a certain level of consumption and uh, investment and and real GDP and employment apart from any of our decisions. It's just like self-correcting. It's, it's really, really odd. And one of the things about this this um, point of view, I think, is that although he didn't say this, knowing his politics, I'm I'm um, confident in stating that he would think that if the government spent the money, it would destroy wealth somehow. So it's like, okay, I'm a private citizen. Uh, a private business owner, it doesn't matter what I do with my money, but if the government taxes it and they spend it on something, then that necessarily like reduces employment and that necessarily has a negative effect, which doesn't follow. Because if you think that no matter what you do with the money, the economy is going to self-correct, then you should think that even if the government intervenes directly and taxes and spends the money, that that should have no effect. If the economy is that self-equilibrating, right? So it, it's just it's just ridiculous, right? Uh, it, it's it's completely inconsistent, I think, because to use this argument to argue for the private sector when it actually is completely neutral on the effects of expenditure, right? Where they come from, what's done with money, uh, is is basically inconsistent or incoherent. Yeah, I mean he uh he 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 wants to do some pretty extreme stuff, right? He wants to um he wants to abolish the central bank, get rid of a large amount of government functions. Uh and I'm pretty sure he just he just wants to dollarize, right? He just wants to link the Argentinian economy to the dollar directly uh, not link it sorry it's already linked i mean it wants to it wants to use dollars right directly and these are pretty radical changes and i think what he'll have is probably the the same problem as trump which is that he is an absolute madman with no conception of how things actually work so when he tries to abolish all of these long-standing departments which of course have problems and i don't know maybe there are a few that a couple that should be abolished right i i don't know uh i, I don't know well enough to to point out which ones they are but he he will have a lot of trouble getting rid of them and then he'll do something like he'll call it the deep state and he'll think it's a conspiracy when actually it's just like no dude you can't get rid of the institutions that actually allow society and the economy to function without having built uh, a ready replacement without having a transition plan, right? You just can't do that. It's it's ridiculous. People will just die and society will collapse, right? So it, it's just um, it, it's 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 not going to work in the way he hopes. Uh, he might succeed in cutting certain areas. Uh, he he, but he, I don't think he's going to be able to do what he wants. And then he'll just blame the deep state. And that's where the, the culture wars come in, right? Because then it's just a conspiracy. Then it's probably, he'll probably call it like cancel culture or something. And he'll be like, oh, you know, the deep state tried to cancel me when I, when I, uh, when I tried to abolish the Department of Education. And it's like, no, man, there were just loads of teachers and people, administrators who were working and public servants who actually first think education is a pretty good thing uh and second have some political and economic power to stop you from rolling over them entirely and imposing your bizarre vision you absolute madman so that's what's going to happen right the question is how much damage he actually does because he'll still be able to do plenty of damage i don't know if he's going to be able to abolish the central bank uh that seems more likely i know the the 
monetary financial situation in Latin American countries, and arguably Argentina is like the example of this, right? People sometimes joke that there's a... Uh, economists sometimes joke that there are like three types of economies, you know, rich, poor, and Argentina. So it's like, it's a, it, it's quite, it's a really illustrative example of uh, just a, a economy that couldn't quite reach the levels of rich, but obviously doesn't count as, as poor either because of all these ingrained problems. He might have some success in abolishing or greatly reducing the role of the central bank. But I, I mean, I don't know. That's just, uh, that's just my, uh, that's just my perception. He recently put a Nazi in charge of the treasury. I mean, that's that's disturbing. Is that a, a modern Nazi? Is it a descendant of some of the ones that fled to Argentina? Well, Pedro A, how does a country with a scarcity of dollars become able to dollarize its economy? How does that even work? Well, it's just that the dollar would be the official... I mean, you're raising a good question, right? But you would just designate the dollar the official currency and people would have to get hold of them. Now, what that does is obviously makes everybody dependent on the USA, like more than they even already are. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, selling off public assets is one way of getting some dollars. The Perrinist tried to cancel me when I tried to stop the regulation that stops the mixing of our drinking water and our sewage. Yeah, exactly. Exa that is literally it. It's like, oh my God, it's the woke agenda. Uh, they they want they want me to uh, keep vaccines for children. They want me to uh, allow people uh, in hospital who go to hospital with an emergency to be served, uh, to to be treated. Right? It's like, oh, you know, they uh, they they won't let the water companies put arsenic in the water. Shit! It's the woke agenda. It's like no, dude. You just can't. You can't just withdraw all of the institutions that society and the economy depends on. It's interesting because libertar. This is where libertarianism really falls down, right? Because it it preaches the virtues of like spontaneous order, and it's like individuals have their own knowledge and they can combine in different ways and cooperate, and that's much better than an absolute top-down authority deciding everything which is of course true but what they fail to realize is that some forms of government are also spontaneous orders and they were created by people with certain knowledge and expertise in order to solve specific problems that only governments and authorities at various levels can solve so so this is uh this where he wrote his only English um only English paper slash book chapter is um in honor of Jesus Huerta de Soto which is a name that I really, really recognise. Let's just do let's just do a casual bit of Googling. Spanish economist of the Austrian Austrian school. He is a professor in the Department of Applied Economics. Sorry, at King King uh, Juan Carlos University of Madrid. Right? Oh, is at the Mises, Mises Institute. Yes, that's right. I've read some stuff by him before. Wait a second. Here we are. Economist Leyland B. Yeager has cited Huerta de Soto as an example of scorn in economics. Yeager states that Soto scorns general equilibrium theory, citing in which Soto refers to the pernicious analysis of price equilibrium at the intersection of mysterious curves or functions lacking any real existence, even in the minds of the actors involved. So he doesn't like general equilibrium. Reminder, Javier Millet was talking about how great general equilibrium is. Huerta de Soto advocates full reserve banking, a system in which 100% reserve requirements for banks would prevent any expansion of credit. He wrote an 876-page book on the subject, published... <laughs> honestly, the Austrians, they fucking love publishing a long book. It's like, honestly, like... I mean, Thomas Sowell, I don't think, is strictly an Austrian. But my man... This book 
is so much longer than it needs to be. It's like 600 plus pages long. It's so repetitive. And then there's like Mises who wrote Human Action, which is over a thousand words. Like Murray Rothbard, the anarcho-capitalist, who I think presumably Javier Millet follows in the, the footsteps of, he, 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 he wrote like multiple thousand page books. It's like, get a fucking editor. I'm sorry, like... So his 900-page book on the subject, um, the sheer length of this text will demand much time and concentration of willers wishing to fully absorb its insights. That's one way of putting it. Certainly there is an element of repetition at different points. <laughs> like, this is literally what I just said, isn't it? About Thomas Sowell. This tends, however, to reflect De Soto's determination to demonstrate that the moral, legal, and economic dimensions of money, credit, and banking cannot be artificially separated from each other without risking the loss of a sound understanding to the subject. I mean, okay, fair, fair play. I, I kind of agree with that. Um, that's something that a lot of, I think a lot of uh, leftist analysis would agree with. But um, yeah, I mean, it's always interesting with this kind of libertarianism where it's like libertarianism except except we have to ban all types of banking that aren't full reserve banking where banks aren't required to hold a hundred percent of their reserves at all time right so just a reminder for anyone who's lost we have fractional reserve banking now right where like there's only a certain percentage of their reserves that they're required to hold in practice the system is actually much more complicated than that it's like uh, but the, the point is they they are there are certain requirements on banks so that they have a, a cushion, a buffer in case of a bank run, in case everybody comes demanding their money. They have enough to remain liquid while the central bank gets its act together. This would be like they always have the money. And that would be a government requirement, but apparently that one's uh, outside the... That, that's an okay intervention for some reason, even though every other intervention is bad. He already believes that climate change is a communist lie. Dude is deranged. Yep. Of course. That's just another way the woke mob is cancelling him through climate change. Oh, stop. Can you can you stop, like, uh, having the absolute most emittive cars in the... Uh, in 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 cities uh, stop having, like, diesel fumes everywhere. Children are getting poisoning. There's lead... There's lead in in the in the uh, in the pipes and things like that, right? Like just he uh, he he's just going to run up against the problem of governance, as in there is loads going on, lots of actions of different people affect each other in different ways. Sometimes people have power have more power. Uh, sometimes and sometimes those people with power exploit others. Sometimes there needs to be another authority to coordinate and correct for those imbalances. And sometimes there are various interests that just aren't getting served if you have a laissez-faire market system. It's pretty simple. World Bank used to recommend the use of currency boards for countries in Latin America, but it doesn't seem like they do that, do now anymore. Do you know why is that? I, I honestly, I, I wish I, I wish I could tell you. Um, that is, I mean, it's not, it's not really my area. Does the new Dutch PM have similar views to him? Very good question. I mean, bear in mind, Javier Millet is a PhD economist, so he, yeah, I think he has. Let, let's put it this way: as with many people, his PhD has enabled him to find extremely high IQ ways to be a moron. Right, so it's just like I don't know if Gert Wilders is is similar. I feel like he's more on the cultural side of things. They're linked, but he's very anti-immigration. I don't know what Javier Millet's views are on immigration. I expect they're probably a bit looser because libertarians do tend to be pro-immigration. It's important to recognise that his campaign performativity got crushed by strict pragmatism when he had to coalition with even the biggest opposing party, uh, with the biggest opposing party to even have 
a chance to govern. His ideas are now up for grabs and he isn't even in charge of cabinet's monetary policy anymore, which was the sole reason people even voted for him in the first place. Right, exactly. Yeah, again, he's running up against the problem that when you want to govern a country, uh, you have to understand that there are people with radically different views and interests to you and compromise with them. So this is just one reason that libertarianism is never actually enacted in principle, except in the past um, and maybe the present under under the you know under the threat of dictatorship all right should we read this should we read this blasted thing i'm going to try and read the introduction because i want to get a a sense of of where where this is all going this isn't by javier malay just to make that clear let's zoom in let's zoom in no that's probably all right for all of you isn't it uh wait a second uh Thanks for subscribing, Ocean Man. Hmm. Hmm. Hopefully this is hopefully this is kind of okay for everyone. Um, I just wanted to get everything in. So most readers know Jesus Huerta de Sol Balesta, butchering that I'm sure, either as an economist or as a political philosopher. A few will know that he presides over a large insurance company started by his grandfather, and that he only works as a professor by night. Fewer yet will know Huerta de Soto as a family man with deep faith and conviction for justice. These aspects of his life are outlined in more detail and in some of the chapters of these volumes. Personal anecdotes included in the chapters also give the reader an impression of his character and paint a vivid picture of Huerta de Soto's professional, academic and personal lives. This introduction is not about us, the editors of these volumes, but some brief personal comments will help the reader to understand the wide-reaching effect that Jesus Huerta de Soto Balesta, both the man and the idea, has on those he encounters. Hmm... Yeah, okay, okay. They're going to talk about economics in a second. The two editors of this book came to Madrid to study under the tutelage of Jesus. Philip Bagus was one of the first foreign students to come and study Austrian economics with Jesus, arriving in 2003 on an Erasmus study ticket. He was also his first foreign doctoral student, finishing in 2007. David Howden came in 2007 and was Jesus's fifth foreign student. He was Jesus's first English-speaking student. In addition to Bagus, Two Italians, Antonio Zanella and Massimiliano Neri, predated him, as did an Argentine, Adrian Ravier. Adrian Ravier. Our trajectories are important to understand what is, no doubt, a common result of interactions with Jesus. We focus on our non-Spanish origins as an early signal of the international appeal that Jesus has garnered for de several decades. Generally speaking, we both came as anarcho-capitalists or Rothbardians in the broad sense of the term. We were familiar with the core tenets of Austrian economics. Austrian economics before starting our studies. We both studied previously in rigorous mainstream uh, programs in Germany and Canada. Questions that went unanswered during our studies prompted us to look for alternative economic theory. We both read Money, Bank, Bank Credit and Economic Cycles and believed that Jesus was one of the few men who could not just understand real economic problems, but also impart that wisdom. Finally, and most importantly for this introduction, we both believed firmly that free markets were the necessary and sufficient condition for a harmonious and prosperous civilization. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like, it's just always the same story, isn't it? It's like, it's like I... I learned I learned economics, but I'd already made my mind up about it. You know what I mean? Like, okay, fine. You read a book, you think it's persuasive, you change your view. Fine. Reading Money, Bank, Credit, and Economic Cycles, you know, I can't I can't fault that that you enjoyed it. But we both believed firmly firmly that free markets were the necessary and sufficient condition for a harmonious and prosperous civilization. Like. You're not allowing any room to maneuver here. This is why this brand of libertarianism sucks so hard because it's so dogmatic, like that you go through an entire education and you don't change your mind, right? Like, what are you doing? 
It's just if you've got that strongly an ideological view already, like what hope is there? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, am I going to find anything in this volume that I'm not expecting? Maybe. Guess we could. Uh, guess we could read it, but you know, Javier Malay reminder is among the people that they're talking about. Economics was, to us upon arrival, a rather closed system. Its corpus of theory was able to explain how society worked, both for the better and for the worse. If one wished to make his positive imprint on the world, he only needed to be proficient in this science and apply its conclusions faithfully. The, workings of, the focus on the workings of a market economy, we believe, applies to this majority of young anarcho-capitalists, at least outside of Spain. This, un this common position can be best summarized as a belief that economic science is a closed system, and that free markets are a necessary and sufficient condition for a prosperous civilization. What, you just said that? Oh my god. They're repeating themselves in the same page in the introduction. Oh my god, I can't believe nobody takes us seriously. It must be the woke moralists or the collectivists. It must be the statists and the... And the <laughs> it must be the statists and the socialists who've taken over academia. Oh, it's not the fact that we can't even proofread a fucking introduction for repetition within a single page. If gold is not a barbarous relic to many young Austrian economists, the concepts of religion, family and morality very often are. Even though we had a basic understanding of the importance of ethics, we had not come to a full appreciation of the significance of many spontaneously evolved institutions such as religion, the family or morality. We did not fully grasp, grasp the importance of these institutions, believing that free markets would largely be enough for a free society to function smoothly. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give them a bit of credit where credit's due here. They are kind of rec they're recognizing the social context of markets here, right? Now they have a religious bent to this, uh, a very um, Christian, Western, nuclear family, blah blah blah, that type of thing. They do, they, they, that's their view. They, I don't agree with that, but at least they are recognizing it. So yeah, fair play. Like markets do arrive with a context. I'm glad that they learned that. Today and through the influence of Jesus, we both count ourselves among the converted. We use this term narrowly in the religious sense, although that too is true, but in the general sense that we realize that free markets are a necessary but not sufficient condition, oh my God, of a prosperous society. <laughs> How many times are they going to say that? Why does this keep happening to me on my live, like, reaction-type streams? Last time I listened to fucking Sabina Hossenfelder's video, and she kept saying, but that's another story. Now they keep talking about necessary and sufficient conditions for a, for a prosperous society. It's... I, I just, like... I, I, God. A moral code imparted by something greater than man must guide his actions. Certain institutions, some religious, others secular, are necessary to transmit this morality over generations. Economics has little to say about such topics, though the economist must use these concepts in conjunction with his theories to gain a full understanding of the world that is, and that which could be. Man, this is, this is like really worrying, right? This is really worrying. This is like... It really feels like you're being indoctrinated into a, into a cult. No, I'm not subscribed to Adobe, and it took me about a day to cancel my subscription. I'm not going back. Yeah, exactly. They re keep you repeating, so you start to believe it. Believe it. Sorry, those 900 pages don't fill themselves exactly. <laughs> How long is actually this? This is actually only 300 pages. Just a reminder, the 900 pages was uh, Jesus de Soto's own book, Money, Banking and Credit, I think. This is, this is a mere 300 pages. Repetition legitimizes. I, we submit that our own conversion along these lines was not accidental. It was the direct result of Jesus. Other students of his will no doubt nod in agreement when they consider their own intellectual trajectories. This effect was not the result of any purposeful proselytizing on the part of Jesus. It was the result of the consistent and continual application of his belief structure to every aspect of his classes and seminars. 
The change in our approach to economic problems resulted from Jesus's rigorous and logical approach to economic theory that underscored the need for economics to not be treated as a closed system. Jesus defends a multidisciplinary approach not only in his writings, but he also persistently emphasizes the role of the ancillary sciences in understanding economic phenomenon in classes and seminars. Finally, he does so not just in the classroom, but also in his life. This consistency and devotion to an ideal, not just a way to learn, but to live, is what most students will remember him for. So I don't know about you guys, personally, when I when I go into my lectures, I am hoping that my professor uh, tells me the way to live my life, uh, what food to eat, what jobs to get, uh, how to manage my friendships and relationships, and ev everything everything in between. That That's what I hope to get out of an education. I don't know about you guys. Like, so, I mean, some people say they just like go to the classes to like learn and have their ideas challenged and gain knowledge and understanding and stuff but i don't know about that i mean i, I just uh I, I like to have a literal conversion uh and you know start wearing new clothes and everything and sort of speaking in unison with the other students in the class and then all maybe one day heading to a mountain top and you know because of the impending state statist apocalypse uh you know having to uh sacrifice ourselves uh, in, in the in the hopes of stopping it or something like that i don't know that's just that's what i'd quite like to uh that's what i quite like to get out of a university lecture <laughs> with this background on the effect of his influence let's move on to the causes what is it about the belief structure and approach to economic analysis that has earned huerta de soto the respect of his peers he is best known for three books. The first, Socialism, Economic Calculation and Entrepreneurship, was first published in Spanish in 1992 and translated into English in 2010. In this work, Huerta de Soto builds off Kirzner's theory of entrepreneurship and synthesizes it with Mises' and Hayek's critiques of socialism. While one goal is to synthesize various strands of work surrounding the impossibility of calculation under socialism, Huerta de Soto expands our understanding of entrepreneurship by focusing on the knowledge creation process. The theory of dynamic efficiency was published in English in 2009, built off his introductory journal article of the same name in the inaugural issue of Procesos de Mercado in 2004. In this collection of essays, Huerta de Soto made available for the first time his broad scholarship on a variety of subjects to the English-speaking world in one collection. He also expanded on the themes of entrepreneurship in institutions to emphasize why the economy cannot be judged, even theoretically, in static terms. Huerta de Soto's greatest fame, at least in the English-speaking world, came a few years later, following the 2006 translation of his tome, Money, Bank, Credit and Economic Cycles. Originally published in Spanish in 1998, this book manifesting the multidisciplinary... What do you think about Yanis Varoufakis, specifically his ideas about democracy, techno-feudalism, and do you response to 2008-slash-COVID? Um, Armin, uh, thank you for the, the super chat. Them every now and then. <laughs> Thanks for the super chat. Uh, I, I, so I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan of Varoufakis. Uh, I tend to agree with a lot of his ideas and policies. I really like his lecture on pluralism. You might want to search that on YouTube. And also um, my FAQ, which should come up soon, is um, it, it has a brief discussion of him. So originally published in Spanish in 1998, the book manifesting multidisciplinary approach of its author takes the reader through a history both theoretical and applied of Argentina banking law by show towards minimistas. minimistas you have to explain what that what that is by the way Huerta de Soto is very hated in libertarian circles and nobody takes him seriously in a lecture he talked about how Rome failed because of socialism well of course it's socialism socialism is responsible for all of the bad things that happened across history and indeed in my personal life which is why I had to join Huerta de Soto's cult um, he's able to move on to the business cycle and flush out the full implications of banking system allowed to create money su substitutes ex nihilo. Many consider this book to be the most fully developed and comprehensive look at the Austrian theory of the business cycle. For the student of Huerta de Soto, this book is the natural progression stemming from his general theory of government intervention and its effect on entrepreneurship as outlined in socialism, economic calculation and entrepreneurship. Here, the specific intervention is in the legal regime narrowly governing bank deposits. The effects, however, are more general, skewed entrepreneurial actions permeating the economy, which lead to a business cycle. Yeah? 
Sounds like that sounds like admitting skewed entrepreneurial actions permeate, permeating the economy, which lead to a business cycle. So obviously it's because of government intervention, right? It's not that entrepreneurs, businesses, consumers, and other groups obviously could somehow become uncoordinated, could exploit their position, could lie, and that could lead to an economic crisis somehow. Obviously, it has to be the government. Right, okay, so this is just a kind of intellectual history. Um, Despite the ancillary ideas that he uses to form his principal arguments, there is an obvious core that anchors Huerta de Soto's work. It is obvious both in speaking with him and in studying his works who the greatest economist of all time is and who serves as his principal source of inspiration. Ludwig von Mises. Without Mises, none of Huerta de Soto's other, more direct forebears would have been possible. These include Murray Rothbard and also Friedrich Hayek and Israel Kirzner. Okay, so shout out to Israel Kirzner, who is actually quite an interesting guy. I'm trying to be nice here. We asked him once what he considers to be his greatest contribution. Not surprisingly, he pointed to his work as a synthesizer of ideas. His works are united as a grand attempt to bring theories together and to make a whole that is greater than its parts. Surprisingly, however, he modestly offered that he has difficulty pinpointing which ideas are his and which are already embedded in Mises, Rothbard and Hayek. Huerta de Soto does not consider his work to be overly original in the sense that no one previously alluded to the ideas. But then he also believes that one should not be too original. Better to build gradually on the shoulders of giants than to throw caution to the wind and make a tragic mistake. Okay, well, I agree with that, for the record. Why am I doing this for myself? Uh, it's not just for me. Austerity. Neoliberal wing of his hated Peronistas austerity. Right. Wouldn't he be in favour of austerity, though? As one progresses through their career, a reflection on any mistakes gains importance. Notwithstanding Friedman's view of Mrs. as a radical, the Austrian's own reflection of his past failings was that he was not radical enough. Huerta de Soto believes this to be the greatest mistake his fellow travellers have made, though not one that he personally committed. Reflecting on his past, maybe he committed the sin of being too proud early in his career. But arrogance is not necessarily an error. It's just part of being young. As one matures, he sees himself within the context of his forebears, an extension of their intellectual contributions. Okay, right. So this this is just about the man, Huerta de Soto. Jesus Christ, man. This is, this is again, this is quite weird, right? That this is the introduction. Like, I understand discussing someone and their intellectual influences and a little bit about them. But this is like, this is a proper cult, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, 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 sorry. Wait, 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 wait. In his speech, God and Anarcho-Capitalism, he convincingly argues that God is a libertarian. <laughs> well, ain't that, ain't that, ain't that true? Ain't that true? <laughs> look at and would you look at the mess we're in god god is in fact a libertarian i i'm in complete agreement here yeah because he just created us and then he left us to fucking die <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing someone asked in the chat why am i doing this to myself i can genuinely say that i'm enjoying this Okay, let me just read this whole paragraph. Um, so let, let's go from the top of this page. I don't really want to spend too much time on this intro because it's ridiculous and it's also not Javier Millet, but we will get to him, don't worry. For her to DeSoto, also like, how many times are they saying his name? Like, don't you think that's weird? They're saying his name a lot. Do, is it? Do they know they're doing it? For Huerta de Soto, the fight has oftentimes been radical against those not radical enough. Friedman felt Mises and Hayek were too radical. If Mises famously stormed out of a Mont Pelerin society meeting while calling the members a bunch of socialists, Huerta de Soto has shown restraint when faced with similar resistance. Along with Friedman, Chicago school economists like George Stigler cautiously backed away from taking the ideals of capitalism to their full conclusion. 
While presenting his thesis on 100% reserves to the society at its 1993 meeting in Rio de Janeiro, Huerta de Soto was cut off by the discussant and told to return to his seat. If the experience was humiliating, it only served to motivate him further. After all, what would have become of Don Quixote if he did not defend his nag against the goat herders? Don't know that example. Uh, falling is our natural state. What makes us men is getting back up and trying again. Did, did Jordan Peterson write this? It's interesting how all of this nonsense is quite consonant, isn't it? You know, when you look at uh, the kind of new right, all these ideas of like masculinity, religion, and uh, libertarianism, pro-capitalist positions, all of this, all of this crap just fits together, uh, fits together pr pr properly. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. If Herta de Soto is Spanish, the most endearing quality is his fervent Catholicism. That, that's, that's a weird sentence, isn't it? If he is Spanish, which he is because he was born in Spain, the most endearing quality is his fervent Catholicism. The most endearing quality of his Spanishness Get He's a proofreader. I see. Thank you, Thomas. I, un I understand. Right. What else is to expect from a man who lists the greatest knowledge man ever learned was that God exists? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm going to lose the plot here. I'm just going to start laughing. It's not funny. It's not that funny. After all, what a terrifying existence we would be fated to without such a realization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I personally love to believe that there's an invisible sky man who just allows all of the bad things in the world to happen um, and is somehow responsible for my existence. That's really, really uh, reassuring. As opposed to the idea that, you know, I was created by accident and I can create meaning by myself without having to obey laws that are uh, that come from some superior being that for some reason I have to pay fealty to. Yeah, very libertarian, right? But if he, if he serves in the ranks of the faithful Catholics, his role is as a frontline private, not a general. Can they stop with this sentence structure? If he does this, then... If he does X, then Y. But if he does this, then that. For Huerta de Soto's role on the front lines, the strategy is to live by example and to show those with weaker convictions that faith and reason are just two sides of the same coin. Well, well I mean, not if you reason your way out of your faith, right? What else could be the lesson from Pope Benedict XVI's encyclical Dus Caritas Est? Any application of reason must accept the reasonableness of faith. And the corollary to this is no less important. An application of faith must accept the reasonableness of God. One needs faculties, faith and reason to understand the world and his place within it. His deep faith does not conflict with his libertarian beliefs. Indeed, it reinforces his academic endeavours and compels him to unearth new truths. In his speech, God and Anarcho-Capitalism, he convincingly argues that God is a libertarian. The stiff competition that, that uh, might be the worst section of, of, this, entire, <laughs> of this entire thing. <laughs> Any application of reason must accept the reasonableness of faith, and the corollary to this is no less important. An application of faith must accept the reasonableness of God. One needs faculties, faith and reason to understand the world and his place within it. His deep faith does not conflict with his libertarian beliefs. So that's a non sequitur for a start. You can get rid of that. Just delete, if you just delete that, right? Indeed, it reinforces his academic endeavours and compels him to unearth new truths. So obviously, reason may compel you not to believe in God. I just, I just hope that everybody understands that. <laughs> so this is actually what caught my eye. It wasn't this. It wasn't this. God is a libertarian thing, right? Um, we believe in God, despite the fact that reason goes against it, because we are so reasonable. It's actually not that. This caught my eye. G. L. S. Shackle famously noted. To be a complete economist, a man only 
need only be a mathematician, a philosopher, a psychologist, an anthropologist, a historian, a geographer, a student of politics, a master of prose exposition, a man of the world with the experience of practical business and finance, an understanding of the problems of administration, and a good knowledge of four or five languages. All this, in addition, of course, to familiarity with the economics literature itself. So, does this remind anybody who is versed in economics of anything specific? Does, this really reminds me of something, and I'm wondering if it can, that, that has struck other people as well. So, GLS Shackle famously noted, I may have to, uh, I may annoyingly have to use Google here. It's to find this GLS Shackle quote. Because Nineteen fifty three. Now maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill here. Right? But why is this shackle quote just a just basically a copy of this really famous John Maynard Keynes quote? It, to the extent that when I entered it into DuckDuckGo, what actually came up was the Keynes quote. Can they just not bring themselves to quote John Maynard Keynes? Look, John Maynard Keynes, much, much earlier. He must reach a high standard in several different directions, must combine talents not often found together. He must be mathematician, historian, statesman, philosopher in some degree. He must understand symbols and speak in words. He must contemplate the particular in terms of the general and touch abstract and concrete in the same flight of thought. He must study the present in light of the past for the purposes of the future. No part of man's nature or his institutions must lie entirely outside his regard. Now, obviously, this is a better quote because it's Keynes. But, like, everybody knows that Keynes quote. Why would you quote Shackle famously? I literally have never heard of this quote. I've heard of that Keynes quote so many times. That's such an obvious copy. And why would you quote him instead of Keynes? I'll tell you why. Because Keynes is a heretic. And when you're indoctrinating hey, people into your little cult, pesos for you, or when you're indoctrinating cents. people into your uh, cult, then you cannot, you cannot quote the, <laughs> you cannot quote the other, the other cult leaders, you know? You can't can't quote the Prophet Muhammad if you're a Christian cult. You can't quote Keynes if you're an anarcho capitalist. Thank you, the cause. Yeah, all hail socialist Satan for sure, for sure. Millet once screamed at his neighbour for mentioning Keynes, so this is beyond funny. The thing about Keynes is he he never existed. I think what you'll find is that the collected works of John Maynard Keynes were actually written by GLS Shackle, and then they were rebranded by statists. Statists and anti-Christians. Similarly, Ludwig von Mises ended human action with a call to arms for The Economist. The body of economic knowledge is an essential element in the structure of human civilization. It is the foundation upon which modern industrialism and all the moral, intellectual, technological and therapeutical achievements of the last centuries have been built. It rests with men whether they will make the proper use of the rich treasure with which this knowledge provides them or whether they will leave it unused. But if they fail to take the best advantage of it and disregard its teachings and warnings, they will not annul economics. They will stamp out society and the human race. It's 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 an okay uh, it's an okay quote. Well, it's an okay quote. We won't we won't uh, nitpick. Jesus Huerta de Soto, name again, is an economist in the full sense demanded by Shackle. In his 
in fact, he is a true polymath in the Renaissance tradition. His use of economic theory as central the central core of his life's work, augmented by legal theory, political philosophy, and moral underpinnings, makes the fruits of his labor well positioned to create a better society. His work points the way to the flourishing of civilization that is meant to be. Jesus were to decide to... <laughs> they should just start, start every paragraph with his name. That would make this even better if every single paragraph started with his name. Thanks for the great videos. All hail socialist Satan. <laughs> no doubt he has had a similar effect on many readers of these volumes. These two volumes are a testament to his academic rigor and his erudition in research. But most of all, these chapters are a testament to his infectious joy in heralding the strength of the market and its importance in creating a harmonious society. Oh boy. Now, one... So the f is the first time Millet is mentioned... So I don't think Malay is mentioned in in the intro, unfortunately, because I, I thought what you usually do. Okay, so just for for those of you who have have been in cults and have trouble escaping from them, like these people. The cannabis industry. <laughs> I'm a researcher studying it. It's very congruent to the early phases of big tobacco's consolidation within the U.S. early 1900s. Whoa! Thanks for the uh, thanks for the super chat. I I don't I I haven't literally have never um, looked at it, but I, I can imagine capitalism plus any type of drug will potentially lead to some pretty serious problems. I mean, um, you know, uh, in the comments or or whatever, you know, hit us up with your research. I'd be really interested to read that. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, of course we are forgetting. So <laughs> let's just <laughs> right. Just, just one more control F. Just one more control F. So this necessary... Necessary and sufficient condition for a harmonious and prosperous civilization. Necessary condition for a prosperous civilization. Necessary but not a sufficient condition for a prosperous society. So this is where their view changed, right? To be fair, I feel like they only say it like uh, they only say it like three times, but it was just it was in quite a short space of time, so it was it, it felt quite funny. All right, all right, we're gonna read we're gonna read Millet's we're gonna read Millet's, uh chapter. I'm just trying to no, that's too small. One second. Let's um Oh, this is the sorry. One second. I'm just gonna try and change the chat so that it can actually uh so that you guys can actually see it. Whoops. No, 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 not analytics. Um, awesome. I've actually, uh, I've actually forgotten how to do this. Cool. Astonishing levels of competence. Right. I just want to. No, don't do that. Was Millet literally a trained economist? He has a PhD. So this is why he is able to write very, very complicated academic arguments about how... Uh, how... Uh, yeah. Oh, jeez. Very good idea, uh, Gregor. I don't know why I didn't think of that sooner. Right. Good, right? Let's uh
He's Dr. Millay. No, you will you will call him Dr. Millay on this stream. Being mentioned before clown wig. <laughs> I mean Right, here we are. This looks good, right? We're looking we're looking good. We're going in, we're going in. Capitalism, socialism, and the neoclassical trap. In this chapter, I will address the confrontation between socialism and liberalism from the neoclassical perspective. My core thesis is that even when we may find genuine neoclassicists that self-identify as liberals, the available academic studies under the neoclassical paradigm are ultimately functional to socialism. Note his... I haven't had the opportunity to meet Professor Jesus Huerto de Soto... <laughs> In, in person yet yeah. this is just torture how many times are they going to make me pronounce a name that i obviously can't pronounce however i already feel part of the legion that recognizes him to be one of the great gladiators defending the ideas of liberty i learned about him through an act of spontaneous order i had just published with some colleagues a book in which we introduced economic policy proposals that could prevent the collapse of the argentinian system i bet and i was presenting the book at a radio show when a listener sent me some videos there were recordings of a lesson in which the professor discussed how prices could be used as a mechanism to convey information and for coordination and economic adjustment, which in turn evidenced how socialism was inapplicable, since in the total absence of private property, prices can't be applied, leading to total chaos. I immediately became his follower. Years later, Union Editorial pu published my book, Unmasking the Keynesian Lie. Unmasking the Lie that Keynes made the famous quote about what economists should be. Remember, it was GLS Shackle, which was accepted by Huerta de Soto himself for publication within the section he runs. And good things would not end there. One day, Professor Bagus invited me to give a lecture on Zoom as a part of his course. I was discussing my involvement in politics when suddenly I perceived some turmoil in the Zoom meeting. I was surprised to see Professor Jesus Huerta de Soto <laughs> who has joined the meeting to greet me and congratulate me for the fight I am putting up in Argentina to leave behind more than 100 years of socialism. 100 years of socialism? What the fuck is he talking about? Argentina? Famously had a right-wing dictatorship. One of the most famous. Okay. To this day, I struggle to find the words to describe how happy I was for his gesture and how grateful I am for everything I have learnt from Professor Jesus Huerta de Soto. <laughs> so, like, why isn't that just part of the main text for a start? Also, for a footnote, it's like really big. It's like big. It's like almost as big as the main text. <laughs> What's going on? Where am I? <laughs> can you? Can, 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 can somebody help me? One second. When was this? Uh, when was this actually? When was this actually published? This was. Ew. Where's the year? Twenty twenty three. What is this year? Jeez. What? Thanks for subscribing, Joel. Read this book and taking a shot every time Jesus Huerta de Soto is mentioned. Yeah, I think... Uh... The second page? Or do you mean the second internal page? I don't see... It's 2023, right? Yeah. Okay, it's literally this year. So this is really recent, by the way. He misrepresents every brand of Peronism to have ever existed. I should imagine so. Does Malay think Nazis were socialist because free health care? Again, I should imagine so. My farmland, Mulati Fondia. That's Dr. Professor. Dr. Professor Malay. To trace out when and where the neoclassical drift took place, we need to go back to the origins. Adam Smith, 1776, particularly his work, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, and the model of economic growth implied in books 1, 2, and 3. 
Later on, I will review what I consider the pessimistic approach, a position which is basically derived from a Malthusian refutation of Adam Smith's optimism emerging from his description of the PIM factory increasing returns to scale. Uh, is he a Malthusian? Or he's going to review it? Okay. Once the terms of the debate have been established, we will address the mathematization of economics, the role of Pareto, and the confrontation between Mises and Lang on the controversy about socialism, the fundamental assumptions of the neoclassical analysis, and how the so-called market failures open the Pandora's box of government intervention, favoring the advance of socialism. Obviously, proceeding on a pragmatic case-by-case -case basis to see whether markets work or fail is a Pandora's box. Uh, what you have to do is be committed to a Christian and Western view of morality which underpins your advocacy for free markets, which are, after all, a necessary and sufficient condition for the foundation of a prosperous civilization. That's the only way to do economics. You can't change your mind ever. You can't be open to having different policies in different situations. There is one answer. And the only analysis you can do should bring you back to that answer. Smith, Malthus and the classics. Adam Smith, the pin factory, the invisible hand and economic growth. What was Adam Smith's main take home message? Adam Smith was trying to explain why countries are rich and why they grow. In that sense, in his work, we may find five elements which play a quintessential role in explaining his model of economic growth. The first one is the role of saving savings, which are used to finance investment and allow for the accumulation of capital. That capital accumulation enables the increase in labor efficiency and productivity, which in turn increases real wages and thus allows people to achieve a better living status. Also, to ensure savings are used for investments in the best possible way, government intervention, which always tampers with the flow of economic activities, must be minimized. In fact, all government really does is contaminate the right to property, distorting price signals and economic calculations. This is why socialism in its essence destroys price signals to the extent of precluding economic calculation, leading to the ruin of the economy. Wait, I'm sorry. Wait, is this is that his summary of Adam Smith? Oh my god. Guys. Okay. So firstly, <laughs> Adam Smith didn't talk about the dis how socialism destroys price signals. This is all much more modern. He's openly, overtly projecting back modern debates about socialism versus capitalism and modern theories about price signals and how capitalism uses prices or markets use prices at least to allocate resources onto Adam Smith. Adam Smith didn't speak in these terms and he, he, just, he just didn't imply this, right? There, there are, I don't think Adam Smith was a socialist. I think he was quite an elitist guy. And he was clearly pro-capitalist in, in a sense that he observed the Industrial Revolution and he thought it was great that wealth was increasing, right? And I think he did make comments about the invisible hand. Their, their context is very complicated. And he made comments about our natural propensity to truck barter and exchange. But I think... You've got to situate him in his context. You can't just be like, oh, he was he was doing what we're doing in the 20th century when there was a completely different debate between like actually existing socialism and actually existing capitalism, which had changed a lot since Adam Smith's day, right? Because in his context, when he was talking about authorities, he was talking about like kings. Remember that there wasn't democracy at this time. Right? He was talking about kings like intervening in society by fear, extracting taxes from people, right? Passing like arbitrary rules and decrees without any type of accountability. That was his context. So yeah, he's going to be anti-government. Who wouldn't be, right? But it, to, to say that that is... I can't believe that's his summary of Smith. And that that is literally... I haven't read Adam Smith. That is literally what he is telling us. Which is fine, you don't have to read the whole thing, I haven't. But at least check, at least, at the very least, consult Adam Smith scholars, right? That's what I do generally. If I want the history of thought, I'll look at like someone like Robert Halebrunner, for instance, or um, uh, Gavin Kennedy, 
was a really interesting blogger about Adam Smith. And he was by no means a socialist, by the way, Gavin Kennedy. And he didn't think Smith was socialist, but he would provide you with the context. And he was, for instance, very against the idea that Adam Smith used the invisible hand in an important way. He thinks it's been overinterpreted. So yeah, 900 page old flowery book. You don't have to read it, but at least do the diligence of reading the scholars who have. Yeah, the concept of socialism preceded Marx. So this was obviously way before Marx, but I don't... 1776, I feel like the ideas were probably in the air, but I don't know. I mean, the, the, the Fabian socialists that Marx didn't like were after that, right? It's more of a 19th century thing. Another fundamental element analysed by Smith, in spite of the fact that he wrote his work between 1766 and 1776, is the role of leaps and bounds in technological innovation, intertwined with the idea of experiential learning. Smith basically supported the idea that a person, while performing an activity, learns from the experience, and as they learn, their productivity increases. At the same time, the underlying notion of optimization will rise, triggered by the incentive to produce as much goods as possible using the least possible amount of effort. Now, let's be clear. He's a native Spanish speaker. I'm not going to like have a go at him for saying something like as much goods as possible, which is slightly wrong. Um, so don't do that in chat. All right. We're, we're not we're not doing we're not doing things like that. Consequently, in that search for saving in that search for saving time and effort during experiential learning, a technological improvement is discovered, manifested as a jump in the production function or upward shift, what we refer to as a technology technology shock. A technological leap or technological enhancement. That is a situation in which, with the same number of hours work, the product output is much higher. Okay, so yeah, Adam Smith did talk about the division of labor. He talked about learning by doing. And I think this is right enough that I'm not going to like have a go at it. Um, but I mean, in that search for saving time and effort during experiential learning, a technological improvement is discovered. He is conflating two things there, right? One is a given worker working with a given set of equipment who gets better at using that equipment, who gets more skilled. The other one is like innovation, changing the equipment, changing the organizational process, which would be a shift in the production function, right? Production possibilities increase. Um, those are actually two different things and you have two very different sets of economic theories. You have like endogenous versus what you could call exogenous growth models here. Uh, he, he's not making that distinction. I feel like this is a bit garbled. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not treating it as a real academic text, to be honest with you, though. This last, this last description is aligned with the modern theory of economic growth, endogenous. Oh, here we go. Yeah. It is what, in simple terms, lies behind the par parable of the PIM factory, or more technically speaking, the presence of increasing returns to scale, which allowed for the long-run growth of output per capita. In fact, the solo swan model, which is based on the neoclassical production function concept, constant returns to scale and diminishing marginal returns for each of the factors analyzed in isolation, is unable to show a growth rate of output per capita once the balance growth equilibrium has been reached. Therefore, to empirically evidence an economic growth, this model resorts to a mathematical trick where technological progress is exogenous. In turn, Adam Smith not only introduced a production function which could explain what would happen in the almost 250 years following his work, but also endowed his model with a decision-making process, instrumented in the metaphor of the invisible hand. Under this concept based on social cooperation, each individual guided by their own self-interest actually contributes to the maximization of general well-being that is the model of the father of economics is based on two quintessential ideas the pin factory increasing returns to scale and the concept of the invisible hand social cooperation under spontaneous order so again i don't want to get too pedantic here i want to stress that this isn't wrong enough for to like bother me but <clears throat> 
Endogenous growth theory is like a macroeconomic theory about returns to scale, whereas what Adam Smith was really talking about was more of a micro concept. So if you had an improvement in technology, again, it would be exogenous to an individual. It would increase the possibilities for an individual. It would change the tools they were using. It would change the organization uh, form they were using, maybe. Um, but that would be endogenous in a macroeconomic sense. And another thing that macro uh, the endogenous growth theory notes is that it actually opens the, the door for government intervention. Now, I wonder if he's going to talk about that because he doesn't seem to talk about it because it's like in investment into research and development at the very least, possibly infrastructure, depending on who you're talking to. He's bungling a bunch of things together that are not really related to sound smart. Yeah, I mean, it's like... I, I don't think Adam S Smith was an endogenous growth theorist in the modern sense, right? He was somebody who obviously saw that individual laborers could improve their productivity by remaining on a task. Um, but really it didn't really matter whether the growth in the solo sense, in the macroeconomic sense, was, it was endogenous or exogenous to that story. That's the crucial thing, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the government is investing and they're increasing returns at the, at the level of the whole economy. That doesn't matter for, for an individual pin maker or pin factory, right? So this is why he is bungling things together, right? And then he talks about the invisible hand, right? Social cooperation under spontaneous order. Furthermore, the pin factory implies also focusing on the skills and tasks required in that activity. Adam Smith proposes to highlight what happens when labor is divided, which goes hand in hand with the process of social cooperation implied by the market process into different activities to achieve a final product. Thus, Smith does employ an example to explain that the division of labor leads to a significant increase in pr productivity. In this context, Smith invites us to think of the results of a person who, in solitude, sets out to make pins. By concentrating on all of the 18 specializations required to produce a pin, they could hypothetically produce about 20 pins per day. However, if the work with its respective specializations was divided among 10 people, productivity would increase to more than 4,000 pins per capita. That is, productivity would be 200 times higher. At the same time, Adam Smith wondered how far this process of division of labor could go, the answer to which was that the size of the market sets the limit of the division of labor because how much productivity would it make sense to generate if the market demand is exceeded? If productivity exceeds the market's demand for pins, its price will end up collapsing and resources and productive force will be wasted in a non-priority direction. In short, what Adam Smith introduces is the question of increasing returns to scale, which is not a minor subject if we consider that, from the year 1800 onward, the population has multiplied almost seven times by the year 2000. Let's keep in mind that with the one billion inhabitants reached in 1810, Malthus, an author I will refer to later on, argued that population density would lead the world to a collapse resulting from a generalized famine. Therefore, it is important to emphasize the contrast because in all reality, the per capita product multiplied nearly tenfold in the context of a population that multiplied by seven. This is to say, the increasing returns are exposed by a tremendous increase in productivity, which computed today would represent a hundred times increase. It, it's coming thick and fast, right? He's like... <laughs> I just he, he really could have structured this a lot better first Adam Smith then endogenous growth theory and how does that relate to Adam Smith then Malthus and how does that relate to both of them you know what I mean like stop bundling them all together <clears throat> wasn't Adam Smith's biggest gripe the monopoly power of guilds well yeah he was deeply concerned about uh, business business people conspiring At the same time, if we analyze the subject under mathematical terms, we must consider that we are talking about a function with a conv convex format. That is a convex function, which is not the same as a convex set. A convex function is not a convex set because if two po points are joined, the resulting line is outside the set of productive pos possibilities. On the, con on the contrary, a resulting line... <laughs> 
This is so badly explained. Oh my god. What? Oh, maths was a mistake. Teaching economists maths was a mistake, everybody. Which point, if two points are joined, the resulting line is outside? He means if two points within the set are joined. Why would you introduce the notion of a convex set? Right? Oh my god. It's just ridiculous. Like, if there are two related the two unrelated but but potentially confusing definitions of something and you're using one of them just stick to that one on the contrary in a concave function if two points are joined the line is within the set of productive possibilities and therefore we're talking about a convex set and although it is not my intention to dwell on mathematical terminology unfortunately the whole neoclassical research program based on constrained maximization put in a mathematically inappropriate format allows us to explain the neoclassical drift okay so there's a reason for him doing it it's not clear moreover even for economists who are true liberals in their way of thinking the paradigm in question pushes them at the presence of market failures to seek reasonable grounds for government intervention which ultimately sets in motion a pierce a pierce of growing intervention machinery that hayek so clearly envisioned in his book the road to serfdom a pierce what does he mean a a process proofread your books so so di so wait a minute so this is a convex function right which is not the same as a convex set a convex function is one that goes like this right it goes like whoa well, could be well could be exponential right if two points are joined, the line is within the set of productive possibilities and therefore we are talking about a convex set. Put in a mathematically inappropriate format allows us to explain the neoclassical drift. This is gibberish, right? He's introduced two notions of convex, not explained why, and then blamed it for producing government in <laughs> intervention. <laughs> like, this, this is literal gibberish. F's in the chat, everyone. F's. F's for fail. In the academic sense. So, furthermore, when an analysing the mathematical formulation of the neoclassical toolbox, the concept of the pin factory, methodological pillar to explain endogenous growth. No, it isn't. Okay. Okay, this is becoming clear for me, to me now. He's saying that Adam Smith, by being the pioneer of endogenous growth theory, which he wasn't, uh enabled enabled uh the the uh <laughs> or or um enabled government intervention right enabled arguments for government intervention but but that's not true because endogenous growth theory is about research and development it is it is slightly different right Therefore, Wilfredo Pareto, enlightened by the conceptual force of the brilliant metaphor which stated that every individual, driven by their own interests and even unwittingly, contributes to maximising the general well-being and its beautiful mathematical counterpart, was led to declare the bankruptcy of the PIM factory, sending economic analysis down the dark path of diminishing marginal returns. So, just to be clear right endogenous growth is a form of increasing returns which is covered by the pin factory but endogenous growth is not is is um uh, not the only form of increasing returns and apparently perito now this is news to me it could be true right perito who was like a, a pioneer of the marginalist revolution the neoclassical revolution in economics as it got more mathematical and arguably a bit more pro-capitalist depending on who you ask, uh, thought the ping factory was bankrupt and we needed diminishing marginal returns. So now diminishing marginal returns would be like, you know, the more pins you produce, the less efficient you get at it, if effectively, as opposed to the more efficient, which is Adam Smith. In a way, he's kind of... In a way, he's kind of interesting... This is kind of interesting from a 
um, to observe, right? Because he's tracing some intellectual history where people realized that diminishing marginal returns was necessary to justify uh, laissez-faire capitalism, which I actually think is kind of true. But he's just telling it from the villain's point of view. Thomas Malthus, Diminishing Marginal Returns and Pessimism. So then, the optimism promoted by Adam Smith was countered by a brutal wave of pessimism, basically initiated by Thomas Malthus. Malthus' central axis in this discussion was based on the idea of diminishing marginal returns instead of considering a production function with increasing returns to scale. That is, now the production function would be characterized by a concave function, and therefore the production set would be convex. This view of the productive system, along with what Malthus called the passion between the sexes, led him to erroneous conclusions. This, this postulate held that when the population was below the equilibrium level, this implied a more significant number of resources per capita, given the higher marginal productivity of labour, which induced more sexual activity, which increased the size of the population. This compromised the labour market since the increase in the number of labourers depreciated the real wage through the fall in marginal productivity as labour increased. Naturally, this process would continue until the real wage fell to the subsistence level. Reciprocally, if the population rose above the equilibrium level, the lower marginal productivity of labour would move for salaries below the subsistence level, leading to famines until the population decreased to the equilibrium level. Okay, so th th this is a basically correct description of Malthusian, right, everyone? So you, you, it, the best way to understand Malthusian, I, Malthusianism, I think, is to know that animals live under Malthusianism, essentially, right? They're like, when the population increases above the level that the ecosystem will bear, then uh, animals starve, right? And the population decreases. And so there's this pessimistic equilibrium, right? Um, and if there are abundant resources, enough for all of the animals, then uh, enough, you know, enough uh, uh, rabbits for all of the wolves, then, or too many rabbits at least, uh, actually, then the population of wolves will increase until they even out, right? So it's that kind of logic, right? Malthus basically said, with a lot of qualifications, I should add in defense of Malthus, uh, that, that this would happen in, in actual society. <laughs> Um, in, in a capitalist society or in any or in any human society which is obviously wrong and I think Javier Malay thinks it's wrong too remember that Malthus was first and foremost an Anglican clergyman and injected a lot of his religious values into his political economy yeah absolutely absolutely and you know it's a good good example of uh, the perils of doing that too overtly, which is one thing that we witness with the forward of this very book. Ultimately, the size of the population would be aligned with the level of the value of the marginal productivity of labor for a function with diminishing marginal returns that equaled the subsistence wage, which was called the iron law of wages. Finally, if there was a technological enhancement for some reason, it would automatically be absorbed by an increase in population so that the real wage would return to the subsistence level. At the time of Malthus, and with the historical information then available, the hypothesis did not seem bad because between the years 0 and 1800 of the Christian era, the per capita product grew at a rate of 0.02% per year, practically nothing. <clears throat> Moreover, in these 1800 years, this growth in per capita product meant a total increase of 40%, mostly concentrated during the century after the discovery of America, as a result of the increase in international trade. I don't know why trades in quotation mark. Is, is he referencing like the transatlantic slave trade? It's a bit, of win, a bit of a win if he is, to be fair. So this is right, right? You understand, like, I think as much as I don't really like Malthus, to, for him to look at history up until that point and be like, population and incomes can't grow together indefinitely was not the most unreasonable thing to say it, it was kind of true up until he said it and then it, and then it changed um yeah in this sense if you asked an econometrician to study the data at that time in history he would have rejected adam smith's hypothesis and would have agreed with thomas Mal that thomas malthus was right 
However, when we look at what happened later, we realize nothing could be further from the truth. Malthus was grossly wrong and Smith was right. In fact, the resurgence of the theory of economic growth with Paul Romer's article, Romer 1986, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Economics, which was the result of his thesis in Chicago tutored by Robert Lucas Jr., a disciple of Hirofuma Yusawa, the creator of the two-sector growth model with human capital in the 1960s. Oh my God, proofread. Not only takes up Adam Smith's work, but also the debates of Young and Marshall from the beginning of the 20th century, which sought to explain economic growth in the nascent neoclassical world. This means that, standing at the beginning of the 20th century and in the light of the data available, the theory of increasing returns was evident, and those who argued for the existence of a production function with diminishing marginal returns were left out of the discussion. So, the his his overall point is more coherent than than what than the specifics of what he said right so you understand that he just flitted from thing to thing and garbled some of the terminology started talking about maths for like a paragraph in a really confusing way and then uh kind of conflated endogenous growth theory and increasing returns when that it's more like endogenous growth theory is an example of increasing returns uh having said that his conclusion about Malthusianism versus Smithian, fifth Smithianism is, uh, is, is not entirely wrong. Uh, what is wrong, though, I think here? Those who argued for the existence of a production function with diminishing marginal returns were left out of the discussion. Now, production functions with diminishing marginal returns, as in production kind of tops out in efficiency and even starts to decline as you add more workers, as you expand an industry, that's still pretty prevalent. In, in economic theory, not to mention economics education, a lot of what you will learn during your degree in economics will be diminishing marginal returns because it makes the maths work. It also tends to conclude that capitalism is good, uh, I think, because um, it, it, it creates a natural equilibrium for markets uh, with no scope for government intervention because it's like markets will get up to a certain point of efficiency, then stop improving. And that's the optimal point, right? So that's like, mathematically, it's an optimum. That also allows you to say there's a market optimum, right? So so I don't think to say that it's, I don't think it's right to say that it's left out of the discussion entirely. Okay. Here we go, everyone. The neoclassical tradition and the origin of error. General equilibrium, Pareto optimality, and the invisible hand. Now, after reviewing in a simplified way the Smith-Malthus contro controversy and all its heirs up to Solo Swan, we are ready to address why the neoclassical tradition ends up being functional to socialism and unintentionally becomes an accomplice of the different types of Keynesian models in the destruction of the market order, which leads to nothing else but the emergence, emerging order of social cooperations. Wow. Yeah, I mean, when I think of markets, I, I think of nothing else but social cooperation. I don't, I don't ever think of Sam Bankman-Fried uh, and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, mass masses of fraud. Uh, I never think of Enron and the same. I never think of the 2008 financial crisis. I never think of the East Asian financial crisis. I never think of the tragedy of shock therapy in Russia, uh, in Chile. I never think of the enormous amounts of social dislocation created by the Industrial Revolution itself. It's, it's, it's nothing more than social cooperation, guys. Why would anyone be against it? Thank you for subscribing, Sands. From my point of view, this is the central argument in my exposition. The deviation happens when, with the introduction of mathematics and economics, along with the concept of Pareto optimality, there is an attempt to align it with the idea of the invisible hand. Initially, it doesn't seem to be a bad idea. And in fact, it is not a bad idea for an economy of pure exchange with no production. Thus, starting from a given point, the objective is to improve improvable instances for individuals without making anyone worse. And when these possibilities for improvement are exhausted, it is noted that Pareto optimality has been reached. In other words, the objective is to achieve maximum social well-being beside the not insignificant matter of instrumentation 
What's he talking about there? Instrumentation? Does he mean the, the delivery of the policy? Where no one would be able to improve their situation without negatively affecting others. However, the problem emerges with its greatest force when the idea of Pareto optimality in an economy with production is associated with the idea of the invisible hand in a context of mathematical optimization, poorly designed conceptually from the link of the productive sector with the individuals who own those companies. Okay, so what he's saying is that markets are good, but the way that neoclassical economics shows you that markets are good is wrong. In summary. Formally, on the consumer's side, we can observe the utility function, which presents the form of a bell, and if you cut a part of it, you would be able to see inside the indifference map, the level of, indifferent or of indifference curves, which could take a similar shape to a banana or a horseshoe according to the assumptions you want to make regarding the satisfaction levels, as long as you keep in mind the maximization of the function in such a way that it allows finding a maximum. <laughs> How did this guy get a PhD? <laughs> what the fuck was that? Jesus Christ. Okay, so firstly, an indifference curve can't be a horseshoe because then it would double back on itself, which is forbidden for indifference curves, just for the record. The utility function presents the form of a belt, right? Okay, let me just show you. I'm not going to, like, try and explain too much, like, what an indifference curve is, but I just want to show you, like, how wrong this is, and I don't know why they didn't just draw them. So that is an indifference curve. It looks like this, right? So it is a bit like a banana. He's correct in that. A horseshoe would like wrap round, right? It would like it would like come round like that, and that would be wrong. Um, so a utility function, he says, let's give him a the form of a bell. So that's a standard utility function. So, so, so just. To be clear, that's not a bell. It's a cave. Concave. That's how you remember it when you're learning. Anyone learning economics, concave. Utility functions are concave. It's a cave. You go inside here. This is the cave bit where you can sit. Right? I, I just, like, Jesus Christ. Right, okay. Whatever. He doesn't have a PhD. It's not that hard to Google. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, shit. Is he a professor without a PhD? Okay, mea culpa. He doesn't have a PhD. It's not that hard to Google. Ah. He doesn't. That explains a lot. Okay, so my, my, my bad. I assumed because he was a professor of economics, he had a PhD. Um, but that is not true. He must have become a professor at a time when um, he's been a professor of macroeconomics, economics of growth, microeconomics and mathematics for economists. He specializes in economic growth and has taught several subjects in Argentine universities and abroad. He has written more than 50 academic papers. He doesn't have a PhD, but I mean, the same problem arises, right? How is this guy a professor? <laughs> Formerly... Oh, wait, sorry, we already did this. Uh, in turn, the demand for goods and the supply of factors will come out of that system. On the other hand, when observing a company, a production function will appear with constant returns to scale, i.e. linear, or with diminishing marginal returns. When this happens, profit can be maximized and the demand for supplies and factors is obtained, deriving the supply of goods to maximize profit. Therefore, now with functions, correspondences that are derived from maximizing structures, both on the side of consumers and producers, the emerging supply and demand functions correspondences are optimal. In turn, when the excess demand functions brackets correspondences, why does he keep doing that? Which are the result of demand minus supply in each of the markets have the characteristic of being continuous functions brackets correspondences brackets upper semi-continuous comma the sub subtract some slash subtraction of continuous functions upper semi-continuous is a continuous function upper semi-continuous so it is possible to apply Brewer's fixed point theorem Kakatani for correspondences. <laughs> 
So Argentinians, um, this this is what he's going to do to your country. I'm really sorry. Uh, this is the this. <laughs> what is that? I honestly, right? I have marked like I have brought marked like some some bad undergraduate essays from people who you know haven't put any effort in they've been hung over when they've written it uh maybe they maybe they you know didn't have a a a great school or family background for whatever reason their essays are bad and i have read them i don't know that i've seen much that's worse than this like i mean this is this is the type of thing i fail right because it's like when when you literally don't know what they mean that's when it's down to a fail right any anything else you're like okay look i want to pass you like i i don't want to fail anyone right this is like this reaches the point where you're literally like what the fuck are you talking about you are throwing in as much mathematical jargon as possible to try and sound smart imagine being taught by this guy he's a professor He just he is just financed by libertarian foundations and pushed but pushed books by coping entire copying entire parts of other neoliberal writers. Yeah, this does. I'll tell you what. Given the H bomber guy um, video, th- this does smell a little bit plagiarism, doesn't it? Like not not over in the same way, but you do get the sense that he's compiled arguments from other people and failed to put them together in a coherent way or been able to explain them properly. Finally, if the functions present certain conditions, strictly concave functions in consumers and producers, that equilibrium is unique. Consequently, now the equilibrium not only exists, but is also unique. And if, in addition, the direct effects are more significant than the cross effects, this equilibrium is stable. Naturally, so, okay, so this is important. I'm going to highlight this. It might come up later. Naturally, since the functions, brackets, correspondences. Did you reckon he just does that in, in conversation with people? He's like, oh, you remember when we, uh, when, when we were having a chat the other day? Co- a correspondence. <laughs> Why does he do that? They explain the existence of the equilibrium are associated with the maximization of each of the agents of the economy, consumers, and companies. The resulting general equilibrium also constitutes Pareto optimality. No individual could improve his well-being without causing some harm to others. A wonderful world, except for its lack of empirical validity, since the last 250 years have proven the existence of increasing returns. And that is when the problem of non-convexities appears which, given the damage they cause to Pareto optimality, calls for the correction of market failures by the government. Okay, so you understand this, right? Neoclassical economics has a situation where agents are maximizing, consumers are maximizing, producers are maximizing, and the market equilibrium is reached. Everyone is acting in their own best self-interests. The outcome is harmonious in the sense that Nobody could improve their situation without harming anyone else. That's Pareto optimality, right? Um, but the the assumption underlying it, which is the increasing returns, is um, is false. Uh, sorry, the assumption underlying it, which is the lack of increasing returns, is false. And he appeals to Adam Smith's pin factory and the fact that Adam Smith won the debate with Malthus as evidence of this. Now... It's a very weird way of making this argument, but whatever. Um, and his problem is that if you introduce increasing returns into this framework, then what you get, and this is true of endogenous growth theory, is like a uh, an argument for government intervention. And he doesn't like that. Okay? So... So again, there is an argument here that I think he's stolen from other places, sort of backwards reassembled it. But the problem is that the individual parts are not coherent. So it's like he's built a car 
out of shoddy parts and he doesn't really know how to engineer the car. Uh, but somehow it just about seems to be pootling along at this stage. Neoclassical research program, Socialism and Rothbard. Here's where two debates arise. On the one hand, when we go deeper into the neoclassical analysis, whenever the result is not in line with the restrictions imposed by the mathematics of optimization, we need to get into the field of the so-called market failures, which are basically the result of non-convexities, brackets, concentrated market structures, whose mathematical counterpart are functions with increasing returns, brackets, not maximizable unless an effective constraint is applied on the set of initial endowments. Second, public goods. Third, externalities, both in consumption and production. And four, the presence of asymmetric information. Okay, so he, yeah, so I'm glad that he mentioned those other ones because I thought he was going to act like increasing returns were the only market failure. It, it, it's not entirely clear to me that increasing returns are a market failure, by the way. I, do, I don't think that's entirely, it's, I don't think they're perceived that way because increasing returns are obviously a good thing. They're like, in fact... Increasing returns are, are something that I would use to say that I, I don't like the market failure paradigm because to have this idea of a perfect market and then deviations of it as market from it as market failures, uh, I think ignores that sometimes some things can be both good and bad at the same time, which I know is pretty surprising. I know it's a crazy thought, but increasing returns are good and bad at the same time. They're good because they increase productive efficiency. Um, there are also maybe even political reasons to favor uh, large firms. It's easier to unionize. I'm not going to die on that hill. I just want to say there are arguments to be made, right? Um, but they're also bad because they lead to large firms and monopoly power. So where's the market failure? It's like it's just a thing that happens that has good and bad aspects, like everything in reality, right? So... I don't know that it's necessarily a market failure, but I guess it is if you assume the bare bones neoclassical model. But it, I don't know. The thing is, there are a lot of what I would call neoclassical models out there which have um, uh, which have increasing returns or at least constant returns and still aren't necessarily entirely pro-government intervention. I mean, I think... Paul Krugman, for instance, he won his economics Nobel, who I don't think Krugman's mentioned here. He's too much of a Keynesian, so, you know, it would be heresy to mention him in this. What I remind you is uh, basically uh, an indoctrination pamphlet. But um, he, he, his models showed that increasing returns to scale in international trade uh, are not necessarily, uh, don't necessarily imply that you should have protectionism they still imply free trade, right? So it's not like, I feel like he's completely misinterpreting the literature here. I don't think that increasing returns always lead to calls for government intervention. And Paul Krugman is, is a really good example of that. On the other hand, if we focus on the solo swan neoclassical model of economic growth, how can it be that the process of capital accumulation, important as it is, accounts for only 15%? The answer is that productivity and its evolution over time are related to returns to scale. In other words, how can it be that neoclassical theory claims that monopolies are bad if during that process the level of extreme poverty in the world increased from 95% to 5% amid a rise in prosperity unprecedented in the history of mankind? It seems to make no sense at all. And the one who manages to unravel this mystery is Murray Rothbard in his article, Monopoly and Competition, which is part of the book Man, Economy and State. Okay, so... So, again, to reiterate what I just said, because I kind of preempted this paragraph, monopolies can, or increasing returns, can result in both good and bad things. It can result in an increase in prosperity. Let's just accept that narrative for the, for the moment. It can result in an increase in material standard of living while also creating unacceptable outcomes in terms of the exploitation of workers and consumers um, and political power that results from monopolies. And ultimately, monopolies can be something that could be improved on, right? Mon monopolies can be create a situation that can be improved on so you have this growth in material living standards but you say yes and 
How can we improve the way we govern the economy? How can we make sure that these monopolies are doing more to improve people's standard of living along various dimensions than they are now? So, you know, it's pretty simple to me. But let's see what Murray Rothbard has to say. Does UE have a Discord? I'm inclined to hold a more in-depth conversation with anyone that is interested in Argentine politics. This chat is counterproductive. I mean, this isn't about Argentine politics, to be honest with you. This is about Javier Millet and as an economist. I just want to see what he thinks. So that's the point of it. But yes, I do have a Discord. It gets linked intermittently. It's also linked on the main channel page. Oh, no, not fucking Rothbard. Yeah, so Rothbard is the, I think, the original anarcho-capitalist, certainly the biggest pioneer of anarcho-capitalism uh, that there is. Murray Rothbard, the dam damages of monopolies and optimality. Strictly speaking, to determine whether monopolies are bad or not, it is necessary to understand their definition. According to Lord Coke, Monopoly is a special privilege granted by the government whereby a specific production sector is reserved in favour of a particular individual or group and where the participation of other members of society is forbidden, enforced by the government's repressive apparatus. Accordingly, there are only two ways to establish prices for goods. One is the way of the free market in which prices are established voluntarily by the individuals participating in the market, thus benefiting all those who exchange. The other is the violent intervention in the market by hegemonic means, where prices are imposed with the exclusion of free exchanges and the introduction of the exploitation of man by man, for there is exploitation whenever an exchange subject to coercion occurs. Consequently, it does not matter whether there are one or millions of suppliers, but what is relevant is whether there is freedom or coercion. Thus, in the case of the free market, consumers and producers regulate their acts in voluntary cooperation cooperation therefore it makes no sense to speak of monopoly prices as a synonym for high prices and restriction of production when there is no coercion and access to the market is free in the words of Mises if anyone is to blame for the number of players in the market not being bigger it is not those who are already operating in the market but those who have not entered the market yet okay so this paragraph is doing that libertarian thing where they try to flit between the fact that government intervention is in inherently coercive and violent and the fact that it results in inferior outcomes, right? So one is more of a deontological type argument and one is a more consequentialist type argument. Now, what he's trying to argue is that markets can only work as long as there is uh, no coercion. Now, of course, property rights are coercive. You put, it, put in place a property right, you are violently... Uh, stopping people from accessing certain resources. Contracts are also enforced violently, as are the countless other uh, legislative and social norms that libertarians often ignore when they talk about markets, and economists often do as well, to be honest. So, you know, employment law, whatever, contract law, uh, limited liability laws, corporate law, blah, blah, blah. Um, so those are all violent. But that aside... Um, what to define a monopoly as a situation where nobody can uh nobody can possibly enter the market by legal fiat is like to create the most ridiculous standard and straw man of what a monopoly is obviously consider the idea of local monopolies right um if if you are somebody on uh, a beach on a really hot day and there is one vendor on the beach and you need some water, they can charge you a really high price because there's nobody around and you need it right now. Is that vendor the only water vendor in the market? Well, for you at that moment, yes. But obviously in a broader holistic sense, no. And yes, you could start a, a water company given sufficient time and like resources and a bit of luck, but that's completely irrelevant. At that moment, the vendor is exerting monopoly power over you. And if you look at something like Amazon, 
quite clearly, we literally just had that news that Amazon was lying about its prices for everybody, right? And it's been ripping off consumers. And that's before you even get to its effect on workers and smaller suppliers, how it restricts competition by um, gobbling up, gobbling it up, basically, and how it maintains its monopoly position. Clearly, there are situations where people can exert power. Sometimes those situations are highly local and time limited. Sometimes those situations are much broader and extend over tens of years and entire countries or even the entire world as with Amazon, right? But those do exist. That is the definition of monopoly power. Uh, this ridiculous definition that sort of conflates the libertarian idea of bad outcomes with the libertarian idea that government is inherently coercive um, and creates this ridiculous ideal monopoly uh, is just is just unworkable and nobody would nobody should use it you can have a voluntary property agreement i respect your property so you respect mine yeah of course but like that's not private property rights as as established by capitalism which is what he's defending right Accordingly, there is nothing wrong with a monopoly unless it is the result of violent action taken by the government. So this, this, it, this, it, this is just muddled. This is philosophically muddled, right? Why? What if the action isn't violent? What is the work that is being done by violent? Oh dear! Press the wrong button. Violent action. Right. What is what is the work? What work is the word violent doing here? Right. Unless it is the result of action taken by the government. And then and then you can see how ridiculous this is. Right. If you take out violent and you take out the kind of ideological appeal that this seems to have for them. Because obviously everybody is against violence. So if you phrase it with the word violent, then it seems like it's really bad. But Accordingly, there is nothing wrong with a monopoly unless it is the result of action taken by the government is obviously absurd. If X is bad, it is bad whether it's a result of the government or the private sector or third sector or, you know, whatever other type of organization you can think of, a cooperative, a worker democracy, right? If the government pollutes the local river, that's bad. But hey, if a private chemical plant does it, that's bad too. And you know what? If, a, if an anarchist a free association and federation pollutes the local river hey that's also bad this isn't difficult right you just have to get if you literally go through this and just delete every reference to coercion and violence what you get is just the commitment that something is only bad when the government does it it's like that what's that um meme one second it's like libertarian dream versus nightmare right uh, can't type, can't type. You can tell I'm old because I still use the word cartoon instead of uh, meme. Does anyone know the one I'm talking about where it's like... Where it's like um, basically an authoritarian state, but when it's the authoritarian state, Inc., the libertarian is... Oh, here we are, here we are, here we are. Right, this is basically it, right? It's just like libertarian nightmare, surveillance, drones, you know, versus libertarian paradise, but it's USA, Inc., right? If a corporation or the private sector does it, it's fine. And Javier Millet, I am pretty confident from listening to him in general, is like, would probably be okay with this, this lower, this lower image, right? Like he would be fine if corporations were running an author authoritarian dystopian nightmare because, um, you know, it's the private sector, baby. It's not coercive. At what point could we consider a large company as a pseudo-feudalist state? 
I'd consider threatening someone's wages as a form of violence. Exactly, right? It's completely fair, right, to say, yeah, large companies, you know, and even some small companies, right, who are in, who are the main company in a local area, they can have a lot of power, right? And they can act as a de facto state and landlords as well, right? This is, this is the, the, ge the Georgist uh, entry point into critiques of libertarianism. How can you justify land? Uh, land ownership with libertarianism i don't think you can and landlords are tiny little states well, sometimes they're not so tiny certainly not the ones in uh, in the in the uk the the, uh, the aristocracy right but yeah like is is thre <clears throat> is threatening to put someone into poverty a form of violence not not to not to libertarians anyway in fact, within a work of free exchanges, if a producer is able to capture the whole market, they have successfully satisfied the needs of their neighbours by providing them with a better quality product at a lower price. Yeah, or they've prevented other entrants from getting into the market so that they have no choice. Moreover, it would be pointless to be the only ice cube seller in Antarctica or to exclusively produce all the wine in a community of teetotalers. Also, even when... <laughs> Wait, what's his point there? You know who this reminds me of a bit, Thomas, is Thomas Sowell. But the thing about Sowell is he does... He, he seems to proofread his books. Also, have you ever considered that you would not sell ice to an Eskimo? Checkmate, statists. Checkmate. Also, even when such an extreme situation may not arise, there is always the possible appearance of a substitute good that limits the ability to negotiate the price. Therefore, the one who uses legitimate instruments has remained the sole producer, far from being a tyrant, is actually a social benefactor and will go bankrupt as soon as they cease to satisfy the needs of their neighbour. On the other hand, the existence of monopolies raises the question of increasing returns, which leads to the problem of Pareto optimality, and along with it, the possibility of a company taking over the economy. As for the first case, it is not true that an increasing function cannot be maximised when there is a limit on the number of supplies. In fact, the maximum profit would be given when the endowment of factors of the economy is exhausted. Based on this result, the issue of the size of monopoly arises. However, this consideration arises from ignoring the question of the impossibility of applying economic calculation. If that central planning if that central planning was really efficient, why was it not established by the individuals pursuing profits in the free market? Moreover, the fact that such a case has never been voluntarily constituted and that the coercive power of the government is required to create it clearly proves that by no means such a method would be the most such a method would be the most efficient to satisfy the demands of individuals. Okay, so th again, this is just word salad. Uh, it's, it's actually quite amazing. Um, the, so the maximum profit would be given when the endowment of factors of the economy is exhausted. So I'm not sure quite what he's getting at here. But he seems to be pointing to a situation where all of the what's produced by the economy has run out. But this does this ignores that you might continue to produce from period to period, from year to year, and the a business like Amazon, which has grown at a massive rate, might continue to grow. Now, by the way, the correct conclusion about economies of scale and what limits them is that the growth rate of businesses is constrained right amazon has grown at a higher rate than almost anything but like if i start um a lemonade stand i don't turn into schweppes overnight do i right i don't turn into schweppes within a year or even 10 years right you you have a constraint on your growth rate that is the post keynesian approach which is actually right but he hasn't mentioned that here because keynesianism is heresy um yeah so yeah, so if that central planning was really efficient, why was it not established by the individuals pursuing profits in the free market? Uh, the answer is because firms represent uh, 
institutions where there is internal organization and hierarchy um, in a way that private contracts just cannot just cannot emulate but i don't even know what the relevance of this point is to be honest wait let's read this paragraph again because it, it, it's it's a bunch of crap on the other hand the existence of monopolies raises the question of increasing returns which leads to the problem of pareto optimality and along with it the possibility of a company taking over the economy right so an entire company taking over the economy I, so i don't yeah I, I don't think i don't think again the growth rate is constrained and there are different industries and i don't think every company uh, all all the companies are just going to turn into one I, I don't think that would ever happen i think that there are degrees of specialization and i don't think uh, yeah uh, each company is going to kind of stay in its lane at least to a degree like lvmh right which is bernard and alt owns the fashion empire by and large sticks to fashion he he dips his toes in in other in other things but so there's that simple point um, which is why one company wouldn't take over the economy. But yeah, as for the first case, it is not true that an increasing function cannot be maximized when there is a limit on the number of supplies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, based on this result, the issue of the size of the monopoly arises. However, this consideration arises from ignoring the question of the impossibility of applying economic calculation. If that central planning was really efficient, why was it not established by the individuals pursuing profits in the free market? So... This is breaking my brain, but it feels like he's conflating a centrally planned economy on the whole imposed by the government and monopoly, right? So you un you understand, guys, that there's a difference, right? They're, they're two different things that require two different explanations. Centrally planning the whole economy Soviet style is quite a different beast to having like a large corporation that does internal organization. I... I Uh, yeah, I, I, I really, unless, unless, yeah, I, I don't know. This, this is it's too muddled to make sense of uh, here and now. Finally, we find the problem around the magnitude of profits and the destruction of jobs by the retraction of quantities, falling into what Bastiat Hazlitt would define as the broken window fallacy. In this sense, if the monopolists decided to save their profits, this would be reinvested in other sectors, thus creating jobs in another sector. If they reinvested, jobs would be created. If they decided to consume it... Oh, this is this was the video, right? This was the video we just... Uh... Hello, Moonshine. This is the video we just watched at the beginning. Well, not just watched, if any of you have been here for that whole time. If the monopolists decided to save their profits, this would be reinvested in other sectors, thus creating jobs in another sector. No, it wouldn't. If they reinvested, jobs would be created. If they decided to consume it, jobs would be created where they place this demand. Kind of true, but they generally don't. If they hoarded the money or destroyed it, the nominal amount of money would fall until real balances are restored, benefiting everyone in the economy. Okay, so I literally went over this at the start of the video. Consequently, no damage would be done to the economy while the presence of increasing returns constitutes the source of growth that increases well-being. Therefore, the existence of monopolies in a context of free entry and exit is a source of progress and the constant obsession of politicians to control them will only end up damaging the individuals they are trying to help. Okay, so just to be clear, he has a really, really tenuous grasp of neoclassical theory. The problem with monopolies, right, is not that not just that they price gouge consumers not just that they overcharge that's not the conclusion of neoclassical theory the conclusion of neoclassical theory is that they restrict production because for a monopolist the point at which they maximize profits right is not the point where consumers get the maximum amount of surplus it's not the best point for consumers right so they restrict output to make more money right creating artificial scarcity that is what a monopoly does in neoclassical economics and he's just not he's just not engaging with that at all it's bizarre proto accusations of plagiarism so can somebody tell me about this because i guessed 
that he had plagiarized this a bit. I mean, I can Google it, but 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 what what? Let's let's try and finish this. Yeah, we're we're, we're not close to the, we're, we're not far from the end. So let's try and finish this. But he if he has been accused of plagiarism, I literally mentioned it earlier, and I wouldn't be that surprised. I I honestly. Yeah, it is bizarre. When I was at university, I remember a subject called comparative economic systems. Naturally, before moving on to empirical matters, the theoretical scaffolding included a comparison between the analysis of equilibrium under perfect competition and equilibrium under the socialist central planner solution. All assumptions necessary to derive a Pareto optimal equilibrium were taken as a starting point. Thus, the demand and supply functions and thus excess demand functions were determined from specific formats for the utility function for the production function and the given endowments so the resulting set of excess demand functions allowed not only to find an equilibrium which was unique and stable but also a Pareto optimum. In other words, a decentralized process generated a Pareto optimum without the, the need for government intervention. On the other hand, the case of the central planner gave a Pareto optimum. At this stage, the problem becomes noticeable. One starts from the idea that the social welfare function is known. In turn, provided that the exercise is subject to the same physical constraint, assuming utility welfare function that involves knowing the preferences of all the individuals in the economy over all the goods in the economy, implies reaching a result that is similar, not only in terms of quantities to the competitive equilibrium, but also that is distributed in the same way, and therefore the equilibrium under centralized planning allows the same Pareto optimal equilibrium to be reached. Hey, Hey, Javier, um, have you ever heard of full stops? Let's assume that up to this point, both systems are equivalent. Now, the problem is that the contexts are under the set of neoclassical assumptions. When some of the problems mentioned in previous sections appear, such as non-convexity, increasing returns, this leads to the conclusion that production under monopoly is lower than under perfect competition, and as a consequence, the economy moves away from Pareto's optimality and this is where the grounds for interventionism begin. However, looking at the analysis of monopolies outside the neoclassical perspective and understanding the underlying social cooperation in the market process, attempting to interfere with those monopolies arising from free comp competitive entry and exit will only generate damage. Also, there is an additional error linked to extrapolating a case of partial equilibrium to one of general equilibrium by omitting the existence of the substitution of goods by consumers. Okay, so... so this is a good wrap up. I'm glad he did this, right? This is literally, right? Nonsense. Okay, so firstly, it's actually not necessarily the case that um, monopolies have increasing returns in neoclassical theory. That's actually that's actually not true, right? So he's he's gone for this weird historical debate between Smith and Malthus which is about the macroeconomy and returns of scale there and related it to endogenous growth theory, which is also macroeconomic. Um, but he's tried, to, he's tried to conflate it all and then say that that's the contemporary case for why monopoly exists. And I don't, it's not the case that increasing returns um, are, the, are, the, are a necessary condition for monopoly. Barriers to entry, which I suppose you could argue are kind of increasing returns, but barriers to entry are, right? And it's like he's conflating a whole bunch of things. There's loads of different stuff going on here. I don't think he understands the basic neoclassical theory, to be honest with you. However, looking at the analysis of monopolies outside the neoclassical perspective and understanding the underlying social cooperation in the market process... Attempting to interfere with those monopolies arising from free competitive entry and exit will only generate damage. Okay, so again, how much do you think he's actually proved this point? Because he had a page on Murray Rothbard, which was incomprehensible to me. And he, um, he, uh, yeah, he, he had, he had just that. And he hasn't even discussed like antitrust law. He hasn't discussed the ways that governments might try to regulate monopoly by like breaking up standard oil for example which they did and how that might um 
enable competition. Millet had plagiarised paragraphs from Henry Hazlitt, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek and Murray Rothbard. There is an anecdote of his making small talk in an elevator with a woman and mentioning that he's an economist. The woman asks about Keynes and he goes nuts screaming and calling her a communist. Oh, I knew that he'd screamed at someone. I didn't know that uh, it was a woman in an elevator, which is which is which has different implications, right? Finally, thank you for subscribing, Mikera. Finally, as if the aforementioned was not enough, to presume the knowledge of the general welfare function, which involves knowing the preferences of all the individuals in the economy on all the goods of the economy, knowing the exact measure under which they are combined to determine an objective function that allows reaching an optimal equilibrium, is falling into what Hayek called the fatal conceit. In short, the origin of the catastrophe was the validation of a laboratory model based on a series of unrealistic postulates which ended up giving supposed viability to the violent intervention of markets in search of supposed maximum well-being that only leads to the ruin of the economy and society. This is how collectivists and false social avengers appear, seeking to punish a group of people by robbing them of the fruits of their work to give them to others. Oh, so he's, he's finally come round to the anti-capitalist view, right? Moreover, within the aforementioned model, we should highlight that under the neoclassical perspective, technological progress is not Pareto optimal, and therefore, without technological pro progress, no growth is possible. But in addition, if we work with strictly concave production functions, growth cannot be explained either, except by Marshall Young's aggregated capital externality trick. So if you have a conceptual economic theory in the lab that is not really applicable in practice, not only is it useless, but its use will lead to disasters such as communism, which is always a threat within the vicious circle of intervention that Hayek has brilliantly described in The Road to Serfdom. <laughs> this is just like... It's literally like he has made the, the strangest argument, which I'm not even sure is true, by the way, that when... Um, neoclassical economics introduces increasing returns you, it necessarily implies state intervention and therefore dictatorship and it's just like mate focus your arguments dude there's even stuff about maths in take out the words like violent and coercion they distract from the pet fact that your point is obviously incoherent don't just assume that Hayek was right about the road to serfdom. By the way, completely wrong, because we have social de democratic states which don't lead to dictatorship in the way that Hayek envisaged, right? And um, yeah, don't just garble in a load of different theories. I mean, how much is in this relatively short chapter? Smith, Malthus, Roma, endogenous growth theory, Hayek, general equilibrium, Pareto optimality, Murray Rothbard on Monopoly, like, it's a mess. The neoclassical paradigm based on perfect competition, attempting to build an equilibrium that exists, that is unique and stable, generating in turn optimality under the concept of Pareto, concluded in an abuse of mathematics that was ultimately functional to socialism. Note that whenever situations that do not math match the mathematical structure arise, they are considered market failures, and that is where the government appears to correct those failures. However, to successfully solve this problem, it is assumed that the government knows the utility function of all individuals, brackets preferences for the past, the present, the future, the time preference rate, and knows the state of the current technology and in all future enhancements along with their respective amortization rates. In short, to solve the problem in question, the government should be able to master a, master a significant amount of information that, by definition, individuals themselves ignore or are not able to handle, which exposes that the idea of the welfare state acting on the market to correct failures is a contradiction. Okay. So, here's a question for you. For a referee and the authorities that govern the referee to set the rules for a football game, by which I mean soccer, but football, 
Do they have to know more about football than the participants, the players, the managers, the coaches, the fans? No, of course they don't. Obviously, setting the rules of the game... Believing just anything you hear about him given that smear campaigns go both ways. They said he had sex with his sister for X. I would advise against believing... Yeah, um, I mean... Okay, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's some misinformation about him. But he definitely is a professor of economics and wrote this. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was plagiarized. And we're going to investigate that. But yeah, sorry. Anyway, setting the rules of the game doesn't mean that you're endowed with superior knowledge. It's just like governance, right? It's like, how do we coordinate people so that they don't get in each other's way? How do we coordinate people so that powerful actors don't abuse the system? How do we coordinate people so that they just have rules that define uh, the game that they can follow? Without the rules, there is no game. It's really simple. So this, this idea that like the government has to know everything to intervene. And also, right, even if the government does have to know some knowledge, let's t take the example of externalities, right? So it's, it's often argued that because pollution is an external effect as in it affects people who um it does it affects people who aren't involved in uh buying the the uh petrol in working to produce the petrol people who aren't directly involved the local community are affected by the pollution that goes into their lungs it affects the whole planet through climate change etc right passing a carbon tax okay maybe we don't know the optimal amount of the carbon tax exactly what we do know is that climate change and pollution are bad and we need to pass a substantial carbon tax to reduce them substantially, right? Where's this all-knowing government? There is no all-knowing government. Nobody ever argued that the government needs to be all-knowing. There's a, there's, a, there's a nub of a point here, which is like a very narrow methodological critique of neoclassical economics, but he's obviously not that concerned with a methodological critique of neoclassical economics because i might agree with a very narrowly put one but he just obviously wants to argue against socialism and for free markets okay final two paragraphs the conceptual counterpart of this problem is the case of robinson crusoe suppose we stop to think about it for a while in that case we notice that Crusoe at one moment operates as a consumer and another he operates as a producer, then begins a process of trial and error that allows him to find the price equilibrium ve vector so that at the end of the day, he can decide how much he consumes and how much he works, something that is obviously quite contrived. Therefore, when it is made clear that the correction of market failures by the government, as proposed in the neoclassical paradigm, is conceptually invalid, taking in consi into consideration that the only ones who can internalize those effects are individuals, once the artificial separation of decision-making processes is eliminated, there will no longer be any reason for government intervention, which will not only stop the socialist advance, but will also allow us to counter-attack. <laughs> Who does he think he is? <laughs> oh, my Lord. I mean, this is fascist rhetoric, right? Like, th this... this this level of anti-socialism is very strongly associated with fascism. So, yeah. Um, so, obviously, this is his... So, he... He gets a number of things wrong here, right? So, there is obviously a reason for government intervention outside of socialism. As in, if you historically study a market and you're like, hey hey, it looks like Amazon are doing their best to price out competitors and they are leading to detrimental outcomes and they are price gouging consumers and they are treating their workers badly, then you can justify government intervention without appealing to a neoclassical paradigm of perfect competition, right? So it, it, it's weird that he doesn't recognize that obvious point and i don't i don't i mean i i don't know what he's thinking but it's it seems to me that he he thinks neoclassical economics is responsible for like the rise in government intervention which again is driven largely by social and political forces 
and the need for welfare states and regulation and nationalization and whatever else to to improve markets also it's really weird so he he has this focus on increasing returns right we've all seen him do that to death he has this focus on increasing returns he mentions other market failures but he doesn't go into depth on them now here's the interesting thing if you actually know anything about the uh how the neoclassical paradigm has developed over the past few decades which a professor of economics should without a phd we should we should add we should add as a correction right you will know that the one of the pioneers of um uh we got the uh Oh, let's just go on the Wikipedia page for it. Um, I don't have it downloaded. But one of the pioneers of information asymmetry, as in one of the market failures he lists but doesn't go into, Joe Stiglitz, used information asymmetry to argue against socialist central planning. Right? Wither Socialism is based on Stiglitz's Vixel lectures presented at the Stockholm School of Economics in 1990 and presents a summary of the central themes of information economics and serves as a primer on the theory of markets with imperfect information and imperfect competition, as well as being a critique of both free market and market socialist approaches. See Roma Critique op site. Stiglitz explains how neoclassical or Walrasian model refers to the result of a process which has given birth to a formal representation of Adam Smith's notion of the invisible hand. Along the lines put forward by Volris and encapsulated by the general equilibrium model of Arrow de Brew, which has dominated economic thought over the past half century, may have wrongly encouraged the belief that market socialism could work. Stiglitz proposes an alternative model based on the information economics established by the Greenwald-Stiglitz theorems and aims to provide greater theoretical insight into the workings of a market economy and offer clearer guidance for the setting of policy in tra transitional economies. One of the reasons Stiglitz sees for the critical failing in the standard neoclassical model on which market socialism was built is its assumptions concerning information, particularly its failure to consider the problems that arise from a lack of perfect information and from the cost of acquiring information. He also identifies problems arising from its assumptions concerning completeness. Right, so the point is, not that you agree with Stiglitz. We're not trying to agree with Stiglitz here necessarily, although I will say that he, the idea of market socialism that he's critiquing here is, is quite different to my um, favoured version of market socialism, for the record. Um, it's more of the John Roma stuff. But anyway, um, clearly this market failure has been used to argue against socialism, right? And similarly, he is wrong when he says that there's no case for government intervention without neoclassical economics. So he's just acting like the case for socialism has come from neoclassical economics and neoclassical economics alone. When it's actually like, no, you know, you can use neoclassical economics to argue against socialism, including the market failures that you seem to loathe so much. Um, and you can also use non-neoclassical economics to argue for, for government intervention. Oh, God. How is this guy a full professor? Right. Because this is, uh, this is bugging me, I'm going to try and make sense of that uh, Rothbard paragraph. One more time. All political move movies must guard against subversion of the cause. There is no example of social democracy evolving into dictatorship. All communist dictatorships were established by force, usually in fiercely anti-socialist countries. Right, yeah, exactly.
Yeah, th this is the this is just the most confusing paragraph. I can't. So so okay, I I'll spare you. I'll spare you all. Hello, mole man. Welcome to the stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So what's go what's going on here? What's going on here? Malay is a Lieberlandian. Grizzits from Greets from Lieberland. <laughs> He's a second rate professor in small universities, by the way, nowhere near an important one in the biggest large universities. Yeah, that makes sense. Javier Millet, how the Argentinian president candidate plagiarized three Mexican scientists. The far-right politician who is competing in a runoff election this Sunday copied entire fragments of an academic article that came out six years before he published his book, Pandanomics. <laughs> Sorry, that just made me imagine a, a quite cute book that's about pandas, um, the economics of pandas, which would have been good. Uh, if so, Mexican scientist Salvador Galindo Uribari didn't know who Javier Millet was until a journalist contacted him in May last year. It was then that the researcher realized that an article he had written with two colleagues, Mario Rodriguez Mesa and Jorge Luis Cervantes Cota, had been plagiarized in Pandanomics, a book published by Javier Millet in 2020. The far-right Argentine politician who is running to be the next president released the book six years after the original academic publi publication came out. A few days after the journalist contacted him, Galindo Uribari bought the book to see the plagiarism with his own eyes. He recognized sev several paragraphs throughout the book, in both the introduction and in the sections offering historical context to make reading more enjoyable, as well as equations that the authors had included to make their point clear. All of this had been copied by Millet. At that moment, the scientist decided that he wasn't going to sit idly by. He was going to use all the legal means available to him and file a complaint. A substantial part of the academic article appears reproduced without prior and express authorization in the book, reads the complaint, to which El Pais had access. This in itself allegedly constitutes the, a crime, the document notes. Initially, the plagiarism made us laugh. Then we felt surprised. The shocking thing is that he didn't even make an attempt to paraphrase the text, said Galindo Uribari, the principal author of The Mathematics of Epidemics, Case of Mexico 2009, and numerous other papers in an interview with the Argentine man magazine Notic Noticius. Noticius. The physicist, who has a doctorate from the University of Oxford, was interviewed by journalists Tomas Rodriguez and Juan Luis Gonzalez on... May 17th, 2022. Five days later, the scientist filed a legal complaint, not only on behalf of the affected authors, but also on behalf of the Autonomous University of Mexico State, which in early 2014 had published the original text in the journal Ciencia Ergo Sum. The problem is that nothing has happened following the complaint. The idea is for there to be consequences, he noted. However, the 72-year-old scientist died of cancer on September 3rd, 2022, just four months after giving the interview to the Argentine media. He was offended to the core, recalls his widow, Susana Bianconi, from Argentina. Millet's opportunism was evident. What he did tells you a lot about his impudence, his baseness, his contempt for other people and for their work, she points out. I imagine that he must have had a team of students do the copy pasting and that he didn't even read it, even though he copied everything, even the anecdotes that my husband used to entertain the reader, she laments. <laughs> it's possible he got some students to do this this book chapter as well. That's mad. You should write a panda economics book. Yep. For sure, the economics of pandas. I've got to write a book on the economics of pandas, haven't I? El Pais. Yeah, look. Everyone who follows me loads knows that my uh, my pronunciation is dreadful. He was offended to the core, recalls his... Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, in the complaint, both texts are compared in two columns. The original and epidemic statistics and malaise, which details deals with the 
COVID-19 pandemic. One morning in May 1665, George Vickers, a tailor from the small town of Ayham, England, received a package from London, wrote Galindo Uribari and his two co-authors in the introduction of their article. Millet copied the exact same phrase and only added on at the beginning of the sentence as recorded in the electronic version of pandanomics. Human beings are gregarious, a condition that has made epidemics inevitable throughout our history, the Mexican authors point out, citing historian J.N. Hayes. Malay barely changed the order of the sentence, nor did he bother to include any source. Fucking hell, who does he think he is? James Summerton. There are so many examples that they fill almost 10 pages of the judicial document. The copy leaks portal, which compares similarities between two texts, shows that the beginnings of the second chapter of Malay's book is 99.6% directly copied from the introduction of Ciencia Ergo Sum article. Other anti-plagiarism tools, such as the DupliChecker software, detect that many of Malay's lines actually come from Galindo Uribari's article. Malay also used entire paragraphs from the article to explain mathematical models along with equations containing the same numerals because he doesn't understand maths as, we, as we've established. The complaint notes that even the design of the graphs in the book comes from Galindo Uribari et al. The politician from the far-right Libertad Avanza, Freedom Advances Coalition, even maintained the use of his first-person plural, as the scientist did to detail his results. We observe, we emphasize, we wonder. I mean, I think we've read enough of this, right? Oh, Malay's book. Yeah. Okay, no way. There is, however, a crucial difference between both tests texts the one by the mexican scientists is free to access malay's book printed by the galerna publishing house is sold on amazon for 18.95 while an electronic co version costs 9.99 malay is selling his book while the royalties don't go to the coffers of the autonomous university of mexico state as they should the complaint reads accusations of plagiarism hung over malay throughout his entire career whether it be his academic publications his campaign spots or even his autobiography. Javier, I can't cite your references properly because in the last book you wrote, you're facing three complaints of plagiarism, snapped Minister of Finance Sergio Massa, the candidate for the centre-left ruling party, in the final presidential debate last weekend. That was the last face-to-face -face confrontation between the two candidates before more than 35 million Argentines will go to the polls on Sunday to elect their next president. Spoiler. Spoiler, he won. Um... Last year, the newspaper Perfil published the most extensive journalistic investigation into plagiarism in pandanomics. The book also borrows from Spaniard Antonio Guero, uh, Guero, Guero, a physicist at the University of Murcia, and Gita Gopinath, an economist at the IMF, among others. It's not that he had rehashed their thoughts. It's a complete copy and paste job. Paragraphs upon paragraphs have been copied. Guerra told El Confidencial this past week. His, st his case goes one step further. Malay not only stole his research, he also distorted his conclusions and interpreted the results in a way to justify his own views. Oh, shit. Did he distort the conclusions and interpret them in a way that was rabidly anti-socialist? Shit. Shock. There's a YouTube theme. Yeah, there is a proper YouTube theme this week. This was completely unintentional, by the way. I was going to do this stream last week before H-Bomb's video dropped. The politician's entourage has minimised each of the claims about plagiarism or has attributed the complaints to the nervousness that his candidacy causes among his adversaries. I only remember some statement that Millet made last year about how there had only been a few pages copied. As if to say, what are you complaining about, recalls, recalls Bianconi. <laughs> On, on that occasion, Millet's team did not comment on the candidate's remarks. At the end of August, Ramiro Vicena, a candidate for a small Liberal Party in Argentina, filed a complaint in Buenos Aires court against Millet for plagiarism in pandanomics. He describes the candidate as a compulsive plagiarist, according to Argentine media. media. Bianconi, however, was not aware of that case, nor does she know about the progress of the lawsuit that her deceased husband fil filed in Mexico. My husband's email and phone died with him. If the court answered him, I'll never know, Bianconi sighs. I don't feel I have the right to do it for him, she admits. When asked about the possibility of continuing with his legal battle, El Pais con contacted the Autonomous University of Mexico State, 
which did not comment in time for the publication of this report. Justice is very slow, Galindo Obari told Noticius. Uh, the year after his death, his widow remembers him as a brilliant man who understood science as a great symphony. An admirer of Einstein, he popularized science for general audiences and was, a pa was passionate about understanding the universe. Being shown his life partner left her with a splendid library. The two shared a love of nature. She still laughs when remembering his books or his overflowing emotions whenever he spoke about physics. That's a legacy that cannot be imitated or stolen. Yeah, so this is, that's madness. I can't believe it. He overtly plagiarized. Now, now here's the question on everyone's lips. Is this his work? What kind of plagiarism software can you get online? Powered by Turn It In. Can I do this? I, I mean, I don't know. This is just a free one. Shall I? So my temptation is like, so obviously he cites authors in this, right? But like, see, this is the type of thing. If you do a quote without citation. Now, one of the problems you might run into here is that We're only getting we're only getting the same thing back, so I don't know. Can I get rid of the bots? They are obnoxious. Which uh which bots? Are you talking about Invalis? We, come on, there are mods in the chat. Get rid of the bots. <laughs> come on, mods. I'm a language teacher. I'll iron out these mispr mispronunciations in a day. Yeah, I would I would like it. I would like that. <laughs> the bots, why are they here? I can't believe, uh, I cannot believe this. Keep asking for my Discord. I don't, uh... Okay, I feel like I can't see that. Is there a problem that I can't? I can't actually see the 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 the, the bots that are asking for the Discord. The double quotes with the search query would cause the exact match in Google. I don't think I um. Within the search query, ah, right, you are. What's this? Kartik B. Athreya. This chapter describes two of the most influential findings macroeconomics has available to it. One is known as the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics or the invisible hand theorem. It tells us that under some conditions competitive market outcomes deliver stable non-wasteful outcomes. The result holds even if consumers care only about the goods and services they consume, know nothing about the others or the world beyond the prices they face. <coughs> Next, the chapter describes work showing that, in general, there will be prices that, all by themselves, can guide self-interested buyers and sellers to such orderly outcomes. But who cares that this can happen in practice, will it? To answer this, we discuss some reasons to believe in the relevance of Walrasian equilibrium for the real world.
That doesn't really seem to match up with... Um, Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he didn't plagiarize this book. Maybe it's just shit. <laughs> Thanks, Zuki. I'm going to search a couple more things. Mm. No. If he is plagiarizing, it isn't too obvious. Um, I will need to know some Spanish to find the plagiarized material. Yeah, you're right, actually. It could have been plagiarized then. Um, translated, right? I'm pretty sure that if it's stolen, it's from other Spanish-speaking people. Yeah. Um, is there a Spanish version? Whoops. Yeah, it will be. <clears throat> oh, here we are. The Mises Institute reckons this is really good, but the Mises Institute is absolutely full of morons. Um, yeah, I'd ne I'd need to, I'd need to know the the Spanish right the Spanish translation. I mean. <laughs> Javier This does seem to be I mean it's all going to be about the science one right but it would be good if I spoke Spanish
Yeah, I think this is this is going to be too tricky for for a non-Spanish speaker like myself. I really wouldn't be surprised if parts parts of this were plagiarized, though, given his uh, this plagiarism checker is still running. But I don't think it's even going to do anything. Fire up that Duolingo, yeah. <laughs> I could just put the whole thing into Goose Google Translate. Try searching capitalismo, socialismo y la trampa neoclásica. The thing is, is this more Spain itself? Good one. We might get a... <laughs> we might get a... Thanks for the offer, Moonshine. I am learning Portuguese at the moment, so I can't learn Spanish at the same time. But I do want to learn Spanish. Eventually, I did. I did. Uh, I did it at school a bit. Right now, I'm just confused between Portuguese and Spanish. Could even say I'm unlearning Spanish. Hey. -o. I've got references to it. Is this, uh, what's this? All right, things are getting pretty Spanish pretty quickly. Was it plagiarismo? Presum pre presumably it's plagiarismo. Ah. No, 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 no. Keep the plagiarism. <laughs> Can clip that out of context. Man, there's so much funny libertarian stuff out there, isn't there? They're just absolutely insane. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have too much luck here. Plagio, plagio. Uh, okay, that's why there's no results because I've. Uh, oh well, that, that just says plagiarism. I didn't even realise that had uh, corrected to that. What does this translate as? Imperialism and dependency. No, that's completely different. It's completely different. Um, so if we go from like O one, O one, two thousand to Busca. Yeah, uh, would have results that are good for your search. I was just wondering if he, if there was anything written with a similar title, reduce, uh, get rid of that, with a similar title. Before his was released. Many Marxists question neoclassical theory and those related to it for its lack of realism in the analysis of the productive process and cling to the postulates of a resentful, lazy person who has never set foot in a factory in his life. 
and as if that were not enough, they are based on a stupid theory of value. What? Wait, he criticised neoclassical theory for its lack of realism. Five years later, he would criticise neoclassical theory for its lack of re realism. Of course, to interpret him as contradicting himself would ascribe to his views a coherence that is not there. He's obviously just anti-left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I give up on the plagiarism accusations. But anyway, we've done, we've done, we've, we've read, we've read his ridiculous book chapter. I mean, I can't, uh, like, I really wasn't expecting it to be this bad. I actually, because there is a version of his argument, which kind of works, which is, which I've seen Austrians make, right? Like there's, I've actually got a book that's quite good. This one. Ah. Right. This book, right, Famous Fables of Economics, Myths of Market Failures, is a book by Daniel Spulber. And he's a loosely Austrian or libertarian guy, right? And he basically takes purported kind of textbook examples of market failures, right? Um, and... One of them is, uh, yeah, uh, you can see the lighthouse, the bees, right? So the lighthouse, the idea that a lighthouse won't be provided by the free market because the benefits are too diffuse. They're spread out across the whole shore and they can't, um, the, the, the lighthouse owner can't make a profit from it. They can't make money from it. They can't harness it. So therefore you need like a public lighthouse. And he says, well, no people actually organize in ways that mean that you get a lighthouse because the the boat companies might come together to pay for it or something like that i can't remember the specifics the point is is a historical analysis of why market failures aren't that aren't as maybe common as textbooks would allow you to believe and moreover the historical analysis of markets is better for understanding reality which i agree with it's fine it's just that um, he didn't, Javier Millet didn't make anything like that argument. I thought he was going to do something like this. I didn't realize how much of a cretin he is, right? I didn't realize that his his argument was going to be so garbled uh, and conflate and lump together a whole bunch of things, not make any sense, be terribly written and uh, just be, you know, completely, ultimately incoherent and get the theory that he was ostensibly criticizing wrong. But, you know, whatever. I think that's probably enough for today, isn't it, everyone? David Friedman, no. But I should imagine it's kind of similar to Spolber's, right? I find David Friedman uh, uh, um, a bit of a... a bit of a nut. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm off. We're off. We've finished. We've finished. I'll upload this to my live channel or, or I'll try and trim it maybe a bit. I just think... Man, I can't believe this guy's the president of Argentina. That is one bad book chapter. That's the worst thing I've read in a very long time. But thanks for joining, everybody. <laughs> See you all later.